follow with me are all online. They're already there online on the YouTube channel, on the playlist. So you can find all of them there. We're using the New King James Version. So if you're trying to figure out what version we're using, why does my Bible not match your Bible, Isaiah? We're using the New King James Version. So if you want to follow along, follow along with the New King James. Uh, my two favorite books of the Bible are the Gospel of John and the Book of Revelation, both written by John. It's believed that John wrote this around 85 to 90 AD. So 80 to 90 years after Jesus died, John wrote this book is my favorite of the gospels. It's not considered a synoptic gospel. And we look at John, he takes more of a different approach, more of a revelatory than a systematic approach to this. And so I love the book of John, one of my favorite books in the Bible. And with all of that, let's jump into the book of John. If you don't have your Bible, praise the Lord, we're gonna keep this on screen for you so that you can watch just the screen and see the Bible there and take notes. You should be taking notes. I pray that this would be a fun thing you do with your family. I pray that Monday nights would be something where you get excited, you get pizza, you get the kids, you get the Bibles out. I'm trying to make this a thing where you get excited about the word of God, where young people can get excited about the word, where verse by verse is exciting to them. So uh, that's one of my goals doing verse by verse. I know like a charismatic doing verse by verse is not common, but one of my goals is of course to go through the entire New Testament on live stream. But also, one of my goals is to get young people and old people alike excited about the Word of God and make this a tradition in your family. Hey, it's Monday night. We're jumping on with Isaiah for the verse by verse, and we're going to learn the Word of God together. So let's go to Luke. Let's go to John 13. Let's go verses 1 through 2. It says, Now before the feast of the Passover. Now, this, there is some interesting language I want to talk about here because there could be some confusion here, and I'll make sure I clear up any confusion with you guys. But it says, Now before the feast of the Passover, when Jesus knew that his hour had, had come, that he should depart from his, the world to the Father, having loved his own who were in the world, he loved them to the end. And the supper being ended, the devil, look at this, having already put into the heart of Judas Iscariot, Simon's son, to betray him. So one commentator said some uh, historians disagree about the timing of the meal John describes compared to the accounts of the other gospels. Some believe that the four account accounts refer to different meals. And then the uh, scholar says, by closely examining all accounts and by understanding that John's use of the word before does not mean 24 hours before, it is clear that John and the other disciples ate the Passover meal together on Thursday. So it might seem like, what does he mean before? But this by most scholars account would be them all eating together on a Thursday, the Passover meal, even though it says now before the feast of the Passover, they would recognize that he, when he says before, he doesn't mean like the day before, he just means before. So uh, it's a kind of agreed that this is the Passover meal that he's talking about. And if you're wondering what the Passover supper is, this is what we get the tr Christian tra tradition of communion. So when you see us taking communion, and again, I want to teach you guys like maybe you don't know some of this, this is the tradition of the Passover, the famous Leonardo da Vinci painting of Last Supper. That is what we're talking about. Now, if you don't know what communion is, communion is very simple. The breaking and eating of bread has to do with Christ's body being broken on the cross for us. The drinking of the cup has to do with the shedding of Christ's blood, which is bringing the forgiveness of sin. So communion was originally celebrated by God's people as a promise of protection during the Passover in Exodus chapter 12. In Exodus 12, there was an angel of death that was killing all the firstborn, and the people of God had to put blood of the lamb over the doorpost, and when the angel of death saw that blood of the lamb, it would pass over their house and death would not touch their house. So this is a celebration of God passing over his people. Now, Jesus being the last lamb, the blood of Jesus prophetically over the doorpost of our life is now death passes over. Oh, death, where is your sting? So Jesus redefines the celebration of the Passover with his disciples and makes a new promise. If we look at Luke twenty two nineteen, it says he took the bread and gave thanks and broke it and gave it to them saying, so this is Jesus, Luke 22, this is my body given for you. Do this in remembrance of me. In the same way, after the supper, he took the cup saying, this cup is the new covenant in my blood, which is poured out for you. So this was the new Passover celebration. We call it communion. But this was that last supper before Jesus went to the cross with his disciples. This is the scene. They're all at dinner, the last supper, and Jesus is, t is teaching them and, and telling them this. 1 Corinthians eleven twenty three, 23, Paul says, For I received from the Lord that which I delivered to you, that the Lord Jesus in the night in which he was betrayed took bread, look at this, and when he'd given thanks, he broke it and said, This is my body, which is for you. Do this in remembrance of me. So here you have where we're at, John 13, the last supper, then Paul comes in 1 Corinthians chapter 11 and says, do this in remembrance of me, quoting Jesus. 
Okay, in 1 Corinthians 11, 25, in the same way he took the cup also after supper saying, this is the new covenant in my blood. Do this as often as you drink it in remembrance of me. 1 Corinthians eleven twenty six. for as often as you eat this bread and drink this cup, you proclaim the Lord's death until he comes. So every time we do communion, we're proclaiming the Lord's death until he comes. So now we're going back to John prior to this, before this story we're talking about tonight happened, the devil had put it into the heart of Judas to betray Jesus. Now imagine how awkward this feels as Judas at the Last Supper. The devil has already put it in your heart. You know you're eating with the very man that you're going to betray. And we're going to see this play out as we go through here, John chapter 13. Let's go to verses 3 through 5. So we're John 13. If you have your Bible, verse 3 through 5. Jesus, knowing that the Father, Father had given all things into his hands and that he had come from God and was going to God, rose from the supper and laid aside his garments this is so incredible. This is one of the most incredible stories in the entire Bible. Look at what he does here. Took a towel and girded himself. After that, he poured water into a basin and began to wash the disciples' feet and to wipe them with the towel in which he was girded. Imagine this. Jesus. Now, in Luke 22, it tells us what, be, what happened before this meal, what was happening. Before this meal, the disciples had been arguing over who is the greatest. And this is in Luke 22 for context. So just stay with me. The disciples are arguing who is the greatest. When they arrived at the house, there's no servant to wash their feet. And no one wanted to volunteer because washing feet was the job of the house servant and it was a demeaning job. In Jesus' day, people wore sandals and they were walking on obviously dusty and unpaved roads. So their feet were always dirty. Anytime they entered into someone's house, there was a servant with a, ba a basin of water and a towel near the entrance. And the, the, the servant of the house, think about this for context, would greet them with foot washing. He would wash their feet. The lowest servant in each house was given this job and they didn't enjoy it. So the lowest servant, there was five servants in a house. The absolute lowest servant's job was, you're going to be the one that washes feet. So here you have, so when you think about Jesus washing the disciples' feet, and there's no servant in the house. Jesus takes that lowly role, does the least exciting job there is. Think about this chat. God, think about this. God, the creator of the universe, stoops down to wash dirty, smelly feet. Creator God, Jesus, we've already established in John 1, Jesus is creator God, and Jesus stoops down, takes the lowliest role of the house, and begins washing the disciples' feet. This is the purest, highlight this, the purest example of true humility. The master taking on the role of the servant and washing his disciples' feet. And we think of the greatest people in the world. We do not think of servants. That's not the first thing that comes to mind is the servant. But when we look at Jesus, look what he says in Matthew chapter 20, verse 26. Whoever desires to become great among you. Is there anybody in this broadcast tonight that desires to become great in whatever world they're in? This is Jesus' words. In Matthew 20, 26, whoever desires to be great among you, let him be your servant. And whoever desires to be first, let him be your slave. If you want to be the greatest in the kingdom of God, this is about serving. This is why I have no problem serving this God, because this is the God that served his own people. The king that says, I'm not going to have a slave wash feet, but the king steps out of these royal garments and says, I'm going to wash feet. This is the highest calling. Write this down in your notes. The highest calling is to serve others. The highest calling that I can walk in as a believer is to serve. It's the attitude of being a servant. If I want to be first, then I need to be last. And we have so many people out here in the church that want to be served. They don't want to serve. Don't tell me to help out. Don't tell me to stack chairs. Don't tell me to drive someone groceries. Don't ask me to pull over on the side of the road when someone breaks down. Don't ask me to pray for someone. Don't ask me to be on the altar team. I want to be on the stage preaching. Now, the, preaching on the stage is one way to serve the people because you're serving them the word of God. I'm serving you tonight. I've spent hours today, locked myself in my office, praying and reading, studying, preparing to freely come and serve you the word of God. So if you're a minister, I'm not downplaying that. There is a role of serving in the ministry. But oftentimes, we want to be on the stage and we don't want to actually serve people. And we're all called, every single one of you are called to serve. Every single one of you are called to, in a sense, wash someone else's feet. And we're not talking about physically. I'm not saying physically wash feet. That's, that is not what Jesus is saying to do or commanding us to do, which you can do that. That's great. Praise the Lord for it. 
But a lot of times we take the feet washing and we make it this thing where it's like we're commanded to wash feet. That is not at all what Jesus is saying. Jesus is saying, I'm showing you how to serve people. I'm, he doesn't ever tell disciples, now go wash other people's, go wash the world's feet and all that stuff, which you can do, which is great. But he's showing you, serve each other like I'm serving you. Okay, we don't make a doctrine out of this being like, we need to wash our feet every Sunday at the door. But the doctrine is this, be a servant. And look at, and I'm going to show you this as we unpack it. Verse six, then he came to Simon Peter and Peter said to him, Lord, are you washing my feet? And when he says this, he's saying this in a surprised way. Like, Lord, are you washing my feet? Jesus answered and said to him, verse seven, what I am doing, you do not understand now, but you will know after this. So I'm doing something. This is not a physical thing I'm doing. This is not a material thing that just is, is about the act. It's not about the act. I'm doing something spiritual you don't understand now. Verse eight, Peter said to him, you shall never wash my feet. And we say this to Jesus, you can't wash me. Oh, I'm getting ahead of myself. You can't cleanse me. He says, You'll, you shall never wash my feet. And Jesus answered him, if I do not wash you, let me highlight this because I want everybody to notice this tonight. If I do not wash you, you will have no part in me. And that could preach. That's a whole sermon right there. You will have no part with me. Simon Peter said to him, Lord, not my feet only, but also my head, also my hands and my head. Peter is protesting the idea that Jesus would wash his feet. Jesus says, I'm doing something, Peter, that you don't understand now that you'll understand later because this is not merely physical act. This was actually a sign of Jesus spiritually cleansing them and then eventually us from sin. Jesus washing the disciples' feet was a spiritual prophetic act of, I'm cleansing you of your sin. I'm washing you. I'm serving you. And the ultimate, what is the ultimate servanthood, servitude? Laying down your life for somebody. So apart from Jesus cleaning us, we will never be clean from our sin. We will never gain entrance into the kingdom of God apart from the cleaning power of the blood of Jesus. The, oh man, someone needs to get excited in the chat tonight. Share this broadcast. The cleansing power of the blood of Jesus gives us an entrance into God's kingdom. And like Peter, many of us say, no, Jesus, you can't wash me. I want to serve you. I want to be a Christian. I want to have you save me, but I don't want you to wash me. I don't want you to purify me. I still want to watch ungodly movies. I still want to drink ungodly things. I still want to gossip and murmur and complain and be angry and be bitter and be resentful and be mean all the time and be dirty. I still want to be unclean, but I want to be a part of the church, but I want to be a Christian. Friend, you are a hypocrite. That's what you are. And this is what Jesus is saying to you tonight. If I do not wash you, you will have no part with me. It is not an option if we want Jesus to cleanse us and to wash us and to redeem us. This is part of the Christian life, to be cleansed and washed by the precious blood of Jesus, my sins washed away and I'm made new, a new person. So stop telling God, you can't wash me. Stop telling God, I don't want you to cleanse me. Stop being in love with your unclean mouth, your unclean lifestyle, your unclean personality, your unclean spirits that you have and say, Lord, tonight, wash me, wash me in the blood of Jesus, wash me by the power of the Holy Spirit, wash me, Lord. I want to, I want to be washed so I can have a part with you. I want to be cleansed so that I can be a real biblical Christian and I can stand with you. This idea that, oh, you're just going to keep sinning the rest of your life, brother. We have this doctrine out here, and I'm gonna, I'm going to take time because I got time. This doctrine out here that says you're never going to be able to live without sin. You're never going to be able to be perfect, even though the Bible says that man, the man that controls his tongue can be perfect. Okay, we won't go into that tonight. You're always going to be a sinner, brother. It's who you are. Show me that in the Bible. That's not what the Bible says. The Bible says if you practice sin, you're a son of the devil. I am not a son of the devil. I am not out here practicing sin. I am cleansed by the blood of Jesus. I'm walking in this with the spirit of almighty God. I'm now there are times where maybe I do something I didn't mean to do, or maybe I say something I didn't mean to say and I repent, I turn from it, but I'm not out here practicing sin. I'm not out here walking in disobedience. Well, brother, the righteous man falls seven times and it's normal. You're just going to friend. Why are we creating theology, setting us up for sin? Sin is breaking God's laws. And we're going to see today in a little bit, Jesus said, if you love me, obey my laws, obey my commandments. So this idea that, oh, we're just going to sin our whole lives, brother, we're sinners. Then why, then why did Jesus even come? Now you might say, well, when we die, we'll no longer sin. 
So your, your theology is death is your savior. Because you think once you die, you're no longer in sin. So who saved you, death or Jesus? Because when I read my Bible, you are a new creature in Christ. I am a new creature in Christ. The old has passed away. Behold, all things are made new. So I'm not living my life of, oh, I'm sinning, I'm sinning, and I'm always just, and I don't know why pastors do this. Like, hey, we're all struggling with lust. I'm like, no, we're not. I, I, don't, I don't get this. There's big name pastors out here like, we're all struggling with lust. We're all fighting pornography. I'm not. I'm not trying to be arrogant. Of course, there's areas in my life I keep putting to the cross and I have my own things that I'm praying, Lord, there's laziness in my heart. There's apathy. Whatever it is, Lord, search me. But I'm not out here going like, oh, I really want to watch porn. Oh, I really want to, you know, flirt with people on Instagram. Oh, I really struggle. Like, I'm not out here at the grocery store going like, oh, my eyes are struggling to stay where they need to be. Like, why are we preaching this? There's victory in the cross. There's deliverance in the name of Jesus. There, there is power in Jesus name. So no, I will not struggle my whole life with lust. No, I will not struggle my whole life with unbelief. Well, we're always just going to have to doubt. We're always going to doubt God. What are you even talking about? What do you even mean? Chad, are you guys here tonight? What do you mean? We're always going to doubt God. I've, I have not, I'm not trying to brag here. Paul said, if I boast, let my boast being in the Lord. I'm just telling you that we've put the bar so low as leaders. And if leaders are up there saying, you're always going to struggle with lust, brother, and porn and drugs and drinking and whatever dumb stuff preachers out here are saying. If they say that, then you think, oh, it's normal. And I'm telling you, it's not normal that Jesus can cleanse you and wash you and renew you. That friend, I got saved 12 years ago. I'm, I'm, I'm not trying to make you feel bad or condemned. I have never once struggled with unbelief or doubt of, of God who he says he is. Never. Now, there are areas where I'm like, why did God do that? Or why didn't he do that? Of course. But I've never once in 12 years ever doubted the existence of God, ever been in unbelief going, I don't know if God's real now because something bad happened. I stand on the word of God. I stand on what the word of God says. So this idea of like, oh, we're just always going to be sinners, brother. I don't even know what you're talking about. That's not what the Bible teaches. Show me one place where the Bible says we're always going to just be sinners. We've been washed, redeemed, made new in Christ, and now we can walk in holiness. Now, if you sin, grace is not for when you sin. Grace is for if you sin. If you sin, not when, if, there's grace, there's mercy, there's, there's blood, there's cleansing power. You pick yourself up. You don't lay in, in uh, your sin and lay in your compromise. If you walk in the light, you don't stumble. That's what the Bible says. So now I'm not practicing sin. Oh, man, I sinned. I said something, whatever it is that you did. But you know what? I thank you, Lord, for your forgiveness power. You'll wash me again. If I do not wash you, you will have no part with me. Now, this is not just physical. This is speaking of he's spiritually, spiritually, spiritually washing the disciples. One of the most beautiful things about the gospel is the cleansing power of God. Because I remember how dirty I felt. Sin makes you feel dirty. Sin makes you feel unclean. Uh, unsaved people say, and I know there's kids watching, but they'll say, I did whatever it is I did. Y'all know what I'm talking about. And I felt dirty after. I watched and whatever it was, and I felt dirty. That's because breaking the laws of God, even to an unbeliever, makes you feel unclean. It's no wonder demons are called unclean spirits because these things literally, literally make you feel unclean and make you do unclean things. But Jesus wants to wash you. If you don't let me wash you, he tells Peter, you can have no part in me. And Peter's still thinking Jesus is speaking naturally. And he says, well, then wash my hands and wash my head. But he's not realizing. It's like, no, this is a spiritual thing. This is what it's about. Not just serving, but who we're serving. I don't, I don't come this to be served. I come to serve. So we need to have a servant's heart and a servant's mentality. One commentator said, Peter's refusal of his service was in essence a rejection of Christ's person. Jesus was saying, Peter, if you do not receive my ministry, of which this foot washing is a mere token, then you're guilty of rejecting my person, excuse me, and you cannot be my disciple. So he literally tells them, it's this serious, Peter. If you don't receive this, you can't be my disciple. Now let's look at verse 10 here. Jesus said to him, he who is bathed, look at this, he who is bathed needs only to wash his feet, but is completely clean. And you are clean, but not all of you. For he knew who would betray him. Therefore he said, you are not all clean. So there was a man there who, of course, was Judas, who was still unclean because he was not willing to put his faith and truly surrender to Jesus and follow Jesus. Just because you're seeing miracles, just because, like Judas, you're doing miracles, because we know Judas did miracles, 
Judas preached the gospel, the message of the kingdom that Jesus sent them to go proclaim the kingdom of heaven is at hand. Yet Judas, the Bible says right here, was not clean. Jesus said, some of you are not clean. So Judas was still there in the group. That's what this whole discourse is about. Okay, it's not enough to see miracles and signs and wonders. We need to walk clean and pure before God. Verse 12, look at verse 12, John 13, for those jumping on. So when he washed their feet, taken his garments and sat down again, he said to them, so now he's done washing their feet, the creator of the universe, Jesus. All things were created through him, for him, and by him. He sits down now, and then words are read. Okay, the words are read. That means if you're new, Jesus is speaking here. He says, do you know that I've done what I've done to you? So he's like, you guys aren't getting the gravity of what just happened. You call me teacher and Lord, and you say, well, for so I am. So he's not denying it. I am teacher and I am Lord. And then he says this, if I then your Lord and teacher have washed your feet you also ought to wash one another's feet and then look what it says in verse 15 for i've given you an example that you should also do what i've done to you so jesus says sits down and says you call me teacher and lord which i am so he validates i am teacher and i am lord then he says i'm your sir this is what he's saying i'm your sur superior for which of course he was and he says if i'm your superior and i'm willing to wash your feet this is merely an example of how you should serve each other now he didn't command them and right there say, okay, everyone wash each other's feet now. He's telling them in the same way I'm washing you, I'm serving you, I'm taking this lowly, lowly road, this is what I want you to do. So again, not commanding them literally to wash each other's feet as a ritual, but ex an example of serve each other, get low, humble yourself. Washing somebody's feet is the most humble position you can possibly be in. Imagine a king washing his servant's feet, but this, friends, is the attitude, if you don't get nothing, get this tonight, that we are called to have. For some of you, washing feet is stacking chairs. For some of you, washing feet is driving an elderly person to a doctor's appointment. For some of you, washing feet is babysitting that person that, that needs help, that single mom, that single dad. For some of you, it's helping your husband or wife around the house, that's washing their feet. For some of you, it's uh, you know mowing the elderly person's lawn in the neighborhood. For some of you, it's praying deliverance over someone for hours. You're like, man, this is a lot of work. I'm serving you. I'm spending time. Let me ask you this question, chat, tonight. Those of you in the chat. Whose feet are you washing? The, the list goes on. What are you doing? Let's just stop and take inventory. What am I doing right now in my life that I'm washing someone's feet? Well, tonight, part of what I'm doing is I'm washing your feet. I'm serving you. I'm serving you what God has served me. I'm studied, I've taken the time, and I'm under the unction and the inspiration of the Holy Spirit. The Bible says as if God himself speaks through us, that's the ministry we've been given, I'm speaking and declaring the word of God, serving you the word of God. But I also need to serve my wife. I also need to serve my kids. I also need to serve my pastor. I also need to serve my church. I also need to serve whether whatever it is, whatever fill in the blank you are, but don't just not be doing anything. And I just, that doesn't even make sense, but it makes sense. Don't not do anything. Don't live your life not serving because when you go to a ministry trip or you serve others, it actually impacts you more than them. There's a fulfillment. This is good preaching tonight. There's a fulfillment of serving other people's ministries, other people's visions, other people's dreams and other people's lives. This is why Jesus said to the woman at the well, when they came and said, are you hungry? He said, my nourishment, my food comes from doing the will of the Father. If you're an idle Christian that never does anything, you're never going to be satisfied. You're never going to be nourished. So maybe you're unsatisfied in your Christian life. Maybe you're bored in your Christian life. Maybe you feel empty and you're like, I'm a Christian because you're not serving anybody. There, God is built in when you serve, you also get blessed and nourished. As I'm serving you tonight, I'm being blessed. I'm being fulfilled. Any preacher will tell you, one of the greatest feelings in the world is after you get done preaching. There's this feeling no preacher could describe. When I get off the lives preaching, when I'm preaching at my church, when I'm traveling and preaching, I'm, I'm, you know, I have that boldness, that anticipation all day. I take it serious. I have that burden on me. I don't want to call it an anxiety, but it's a burden. I got to preach the word. There, people's lives are at stake. There might be people listening to this that die tomorrow. I got to preach the word. I got to handle the word of God with, with utmost respect and authority. I got to make sure I'm properly handling God's word. You know, so we go to Bible college and we get degrees and we do all these things to make sure it's proper. And then you deliver the word of God. The Bible says the foolishness of preaching God uses to save men's souls. And then I'm done. I end the stream and I'm like, 
best feeling in the world that I deliver the word. It nourishes me. It brings life to me. So some of you, you're just not nourished or you're just not passionate or you're not satisfied because you're not doing anything. And I'm trying not to be rude when I say that. And I know people hate when I say it, but it is the truth. You're not doing anything. You need to do something for God because you are created to serve. No one graduates out of serving. Nobody gets too educated. Is there any pastors in the chat tonight? Type one. Nobody gets too knowledgeable. No one gets too old. I will never graduate out of serving. I live my life to serve the people of God in whatever capacity that would be. I love to serve. I love serve in the house of God. Serve your pastors. Serve your leaders. Serve your, your wife. Serve your husband. Wash feet. Wash feet. Whose feet have you been washing? And again, this is not a literal ritual we're called to do. And if you do that, again, people do it at weddings. People do it at church and all that. All, all cool. Praise the Lord. There's nothing negative about it. But he wasn't saying do the ritual of washing feet. He was saying serve people. He says, most assuredly, I say to you, a servant is not greater than his master, nor is he who is sent greater than the one who sent him. If you know these things, blessed are you if you do them. So he's saying this, in the same way servants aren't greater than their masters, Jesus is going, "Uh, I'm the master of the universe. So if I can serve the disciples who obviously in a hierarchy sense, Jesus was above the disciples, if the guy that's above them can serve them, then surely they can serve others. Like you can do it. If Jesus can serve you, you can serve others. So when we're serving others, we're also serving Christ by doing what he calls to do. There's a, there's an idea of judgment day and I won't go into it for the sake of time or go to the scripture, but Jesus basically says, I was hungry and you didn't feed me. I was thirsty and you didn't give me water. I was in jail and you didn't come visit me. I was in the hospital and you didn't come visit me. And they're on judgment day saying, when did we see you sick? When did we see you in jail? When did we see you Thursday? Of course, if Jesus said, give me some water, you'd be like, here you go, right away, instantly. But he says, when you've done it to the least of these, you've done it to me. Because then there's others that he says, when I was thirsty, you gave me water. This is judgment day. When I was hungry, you gave me food. When I was in prison, you visited me. When I was in hospital, you visited me. And they say, Lord, when did we do any of that? that? This is the other group. And he says, when you did it to the least of these, you've done it to me. So imagine this idea of like, the least of these. Imagine there's a poor person that's hungry and you give them food. Okay, don't twist what I'm saying here. Biblically, Jesus says there's times when you do it for them, you've done it to me. How could I feed a homeless person and it's as as if I'm feeding Jesus? But Jesus said, because you've done it, you've served the least of these. If you're a, you know, say you're a business owner, an entrepreneur, a doctor, a nurse, you're high up somewhere and you're making a lot of money per year and you see a homeless person, and you take your expensive coat off and you wrap them in that coat and you go down and you take your socks off and you put your socks on them and you put them in your brand new Mercedes, $150,000, $200,000 brand new Mercedes and they're dirty, they're smelly. You know, they have, you know, they, they just haven't showered in months and they're stained clothes and you put them in your car and they're smelling up your brand new, you know, nice interior and you drive them to uh, In-N-Out Burger or wherever and you give them, get them a nice meal and you go in there, you have no socks on, no jacket and you feed them and all. Jesus says the least of these, you're a higher in, in society, you're, you're a higher position than them. But you take that lowly road of the servant and you serve the least of these and then on judgment day, Jesus goes, when you fed them, you were feeding me. Because if you saw Jesus on the corner asking for money, poor, like that homeless person, you'd be like, Jesus, get in, get in. There's no question. But this is what he's saying. What a powerful word. Jesus is saying, whenever you do it for the least of these, you've done it for me. And I'll do a whole sermon on that. And I've done it before in the past, but he's going, it's that higher position to that lower position. What a beautiful thing it is. Okay. Verse 18, we have two chapters to get through and we're 30 minutes in, so I really need to go here. Verse 18 here, he says, I do not speak concerning all of you. I know whom I've chosen, but the scripture may be fulfilled. He who eats bread with me has lifted up his heel against me. Now I tell you before it comes to that, when it does come to pass, you may believe that I am he, capital H. Most assuredly, I say to you, he who receives whomever I send receives me. And he who receives me receives receives he who sent me. So he's speaking of Judas here. Judas spent three years with Jesus, eating, traveling, seeing miracles, doing miracles, hearing his teachings, watching Jesus in private, yet Judas still didn't truly believe in Jesus. Now, Jesus isn't surprised. He related what Judas is about to do in scripture with the lifting up in the heel, which in Hebrew means has made his heel great against me. It's a phrase used to show the pain caused by a friend's betrayal. 
And he's actually quoting a portion of what Jesus quotes here is in context of David's betrayal by um, Ahithophel. How do I say that? Ahithophel. It's a weird name. But Ahithophel betrayed. This is one of David's advisors. Ahithophel betrays David, which makes the betrayal more significant because they're friends. He's David's advisor. So he lifted up his heel against David. Jesus is quoting that Psalms saying in the same way David's advisor lifted and betrayed him, lifted up his heel, backstabbed him as a friend. It feels worse. It's lifting up the heel in Hebrew. Jesus says, this man who is Judas, he's going to lift his heel up against me. And, he's, and of course, he's speaking of Judas here. Verse 21, when Jesus said these things, he was troubled in his spirit and testified and said, most assuredly, I say to you, one of you will betray me. Then the disciples, look at what the disciples do here. Then the disciples, uh, verse 22, looked at one another perplexed about whom he spoke. That's verse 21. So the disciples, think about this. Judas did, oh, this is this, I'm tr trying to preach a whole sermon here. Judas did such a good job at faking everyone out, at being a hypocrite. Even when Jesus was talking about one of you will betray me, the disciples had no clue who he was talking about. Some of us are such good hypocrites, no one would even believe that we're hypocrites. No one would even believe that we, are gonna, we betray Jesus every single day with our life. So the disciples are like, who's that? Because Judas did such a good job at playing it off. Now, it's one thing for a pastor or leader to, to fall and stumble. And you go, oh, I saw that coming, which I won't throw out any names here. I almost did. There's some preachers, let's just say it this way, that will publicly fall. They'll cheat on their wife. They'll get caught doing embezzling, whatever. And I'm like, okay, you see smoke, there's a fire. We've been watching smoke for this guy for years. We knew he was going to fall. Like, no one's surprised that that guy fell. That's not who Judas was. Judas was a guy where you go, I never saw that coming. Like, I have pastors I preached for for eight, 10 years, and they end up falling. And I'm like, no way. There's no way I saw that. Like, that pastor, I would never even imagine. They were so good at faking it covering up their sin i would have never even dreamed that they would have fallen like that so that's that's how judas was one commentator said the synoptics note that after another they begin to ask lord is it i so in matthew 26 22 they all asked is it i lord is it i and john we don't see that account but in matthew we see that account and then the commentator says each question asked for a negative answer finally judas let his silence betray him and said rabbi is it i and that's in matthew 26 25 and he says, Rabbi, not Lord. So notice that in Matthew, Matthew's account, Judas doesn't call him Lord. He calls him Rabbi. And he hopes that Jesus would give a negative answer because he's trying to blend in with everyone saying, who, who is it that's going to betray you? Judas knew he was going to betray Jesus because the Bible says, excuse me, I got allergies if you wonder why I'm breathing this way. But the Bible says clearly the devil had already convinced Judas to betray Jesus. So in the Matthew's account, they all said, Lord, is it I? But Jesus makes it clear, one of you, someone here is going to betray me here. Okay. One of you betraying the disciples look said, who is he spoke about? Look at verse 23 here. Now there was a leaning. Now there was leaning on Jesus's bosom. I always have a hard time saying that word on his bosom. One of his disciples, that's his, that means his chest, by the way. Okay. We're reading new King James version whom Jesus loved. Simon Peter, therefore motioned him to ask who it was from whom he spoke. Then look what it says here. Then leaning back on Jesus's breast, his chest, he said to him, Lord, who is it? So the guy leaning on Jesus is John, the disciple. And I love how John writes, look at what John writes. John writes, the disciple whom Jesus loved. But you got to laugh because John wrote this. Like imagine me writing something like, oh, I'm Jesus' favorite disciple. But John writes, the disciple whom Jesus loved. But then it says he was leaning. Now Peter motions to John and goes, ask him who it was. <laughs> ask him, ask him who's the one that's going to betray him. So now, I want to read a, comment uh, a commentator here, a historian. They said, contrary to Leonardo da Vinci's famous painting of the Last Supper, Jesus and his disciples, now this is going to ruin it for some of you, Jesus and his disciples did not all sit on chairs, all on the same side of the table. So the idea that Leonardo uh, da Vinci painted the Last Supper, that's not the way it was. Okay, They didn't all sit on chairs on the same side of the table. Although people sat for every everyday meals, a reclining at a reclining at a table was reserved for special occasions. For the Passover dinner, the men reclined on large floor pillows or backless couches. So imagine like a large like bean beanbag chair almost, or like a couch that had no back on it, like a large couch with no back. Okay, um, they leaned on their left elbows, eating with their right hand. So they would sit 
leaning like this, sitting up on the thing, and eating with their right hand. And I'm not going to try to motion it out here because it'll just be funny. The seats of honor were on either side of the host. Since John, look at this, was sitting at the right hand of Jesus, he could lean his head back against Jesus' chest. Are you guys seeing this? Peter had a lot of practice speaking up, so it's not surprising that he was what he said was on everyone's mind. What is surprising is that Peter, Peter did not ask Jesus directly. Instead, he went through John. Maybe he didn't want everyone to hear him, so he asked John, the disciple whom Jesus loved, who was sitting next to Jesus. So he asked uh, Peter, asked John, who's sitting next to Jesus, to ask, and he whispers this question. And look at verse 26 here. Jesus answered, it is, it is he to whom I shall give a piece of bread when I have dipped it. So it doesn't seem that Jesus is saying this out loud. Like, it's the guy that I dip it in. Like, it seems to be Jesus is doing this very, you know, quietly or discreetly and having dipped the bread he gave it to judas iscariot the son of simon now after the piece of bread satan entered him now that is an interesting line there that's hard to understand but satan entered him that's what the bible says well was it just the thought was it is the bible says satan entered him so we're going to go by what the bible says then jesus said to him do what you do quickly so look at this here it wasn't over advertly it was discreet the way jesus showed and identified his betrayer was discreet now one commentator said the act was a sign of friendship and honor so when you dip the bread in and then give it to them it's an act of honor and an act of friendship that's what the, the historian the commentator said the other disciples would have thought it strange for jesus to do would have not thought it was strange for jesus to do this jesus was doing this showing his love for judas but judas ignored the meaning Judas chose to follow with his plans, and at that moment, Satan took control of him. Table fellowship had more significance to, for Jews than a simple social gathering. Look at this. Eating together was evidence of peace, trust, forgiveness, and brotherhood. To betray the one who had given you his bread was a horrendous act. Satan entered Judas after all of this. Um, we don't know exactly how that all works. We know Satan can enter human bodies and we know demons for sure can and do enter human bodies. So Satan was there plotting. Obviously, he thought killing Jesus would be his greatest victory. Turned out to be his greatest defeat. But just know Jesus was being discreet when he dipped the bread. They didn't know like, oh, this must be Judas. Okay. Because look what it's going to say here. Look what it says here in verse 28. And I'm going to prove it to you that they didn't know it was Judas because it says, but no one at the table, look at this. Spoiler alert, no one at the table knew for what reason he said this to him. So no one knows, like, what is he talking about? And then verse 29, for some thought, because Judas had the money box that Jesus said to him, buy those things we need for the feast or that we should give some things to the poor. So when Jesus said, what you do, do it quickly, nobody knows what he's talking about. The next verse says, they didn't know what he was talking about. Judas had the money box that Jesus gave to him, uh, that Jesus had said to him, buy those things what we need for the feast. So they think Jesus is just telling, uh, go buy quickly some bread and stuff for the poor. Having received the piece of bread, verse 30, he went out immediately and it was night, okay? And then we're going to know, obviously, Judas betrays Jesus and Matthew goes into much detail on that, but we're in John. We're not in Matthew. So we're going to go into the book of John. What does John have to account and what does John have to say? Verse 31. So when he went out, Jesus said, now the son of man is glorified and God is glorified in him. If God is glorified in him, God will also glorify him in himself and glorify him immediately. Little children, I shall be with you a little while longer. You will seek me. And as I said to the Jews, where I'm going, you cannot come. So now I say to you, a new commandment, a new commandment I give to you. So what's the new commandment? That you love one another as I have loved you, that you may also love, that you also love one another. By this, they will all know that you are my disciples if you have love for one another. Okay. So chapters 13 through 17 are going to be Jesus's final words to his disciples in the book of John. When a man back then was dying or leaving for battle in those days, he would leave an important teaching to his children who in turn would read them from generation to generation. That's how it worked. So Jesus knows he's about to die. We or the disciples are his children. This is Jesus's deathbed instructions. And, and I could say that with the loose words. Okay, he's not literally on a deathbed. Okay, he's going to be like, he's a heretic. He said he's on a deathbed. Jesus is about to die. So in a, in, a, in a sense, if someone's about to die, they have a week left to live, it's like, okay, they're on their deathbed. Jesus is, this is Holy Week, Thursday. Here we are now. Jesus is giving, this is his final words to his disciples. Final instructions. And the first thing 
First thing he wants to do. Now we're going to go through verse chapter 13 through 17 in the weeks to come. But the first, and we might need to add a live stream day somewhere because we got to get th through this. But the first thing he says is, I have a new commandment. Now you might ask, how is this a new commandment, Jesus? You already told us to love our neighbors. Aren't you telling us that again? No. He says, love one another, but here's the new commandment. Here's where the power lies. As I have loved you. That's a game changer. So don't just love your neighbor, your wife, your family, your friend, whoever it is that you have to love, whoever's around you, love them the way I have loved you. That is, love those people around you. Now, some of you that don't love anybody are going to just click off because you're going to be about to get uncomfortable. Love the people around you unconditionally. That means I don't want nothing from you. I don't need nothing from you. This is not uh, conditional. I love you without condition. In our culture, love has conditions. I love you because you do this for me. I love you because you're good looking. I love you because you have this. I love you because you have that. We have all these vain, shallow things that we love. Unconditional love says, it doesn't matter what you do, I'm still going to love you unconditionally. That's the unconditional love of God. Here's another scary thought about the unconditional love of God. Because people say, well, how could God love you and throw you into hell? Because by the way, God is the one that throws people into hell, according to the Bible. The devil throws nobody into hell. God's the one that throws people into hell. How could God love you and then throw you into hell? Easy. It's unconditional. The unconditional love of God goes both ways. It goes in one sense. God's love was that without conditions. No matter what I do, God still loves me. The other side is God could, lo could love me and then throw me right into hell because his love has no condition. So this is not a teddy bear, tickle me Elmo Jesus that like just doesn't throw anyone to hell because of love. Love is unconditional. And we need to love people unconditionally. We need to also love people humbly. We need to also love people sacrificially. True love costs something. You sacrifice when you love your kids. You sacrifice when you love your wife. You sacrifice when you love other believers. So the commandment is this. This is not an option. This is not the great opinion. This is the great commandment here. A new commandment. Love one another as I loved you. The first order of business. Pa passionately sacrificially un however jesus loved me i'm called to love other people in that same way the same way i've loved you what a powerful thing here and what's the key to identify a christian their love for one another let me ask you this chap is that how we're identified now in culture are we identified as oh those christians they just love each other so much man they just got so much love for one another they're always helping each other they're always just you know, unifying, coming together for the common good of culture. They bring reformation. They're just the first people we call that just love pours out of them. No, the church is known for we're arguing, we bicker, we call each other out. Everybody has a different doctrine. Like we are so divisive. That's why I, I, it takes something extreme for me to call out anybody. Cause I'm going like, we don't need more division. If now, if it's not a, if it's a secondary, if it's a, you know, salvific issue, and they're just a heretic, then okay, that's one thing. But if it's secondary issues, I'm not gonna be calling people out for secondary issues. We're supposed to love each other, help each other, talk these things out. And we have all these people out here just arguing and bickering and we look terrible to the world when he says, they're gonna know you by your love for one another. Verse 36, Simon Peter said to him, Lord, where are you going? Jesus answered him, where I'm going, you cannot follow me now, but you shall follow me afterward. Peter said to him, Lord, why can I not follow you now? I will lay down my life for your sake. Jesus said, will you lay down your life for my sake? Look at this. Most assuredly, I say to you, the rooster shall not crow till you've denied me three times. Peter's extremely zealous. Says, I'll die for you, Jesus. How many of us are like that in the chat tonight? I'll die for you, Jesus. And he goes, he goes, Peter, you're going to die for me? He goes, Peter, you're going to deny me three times before the rooster crows. Like, why is it? I'm preaching to myself. We think so highly of ourselves. Like, I'm ready to be persecuted and die for God. And he goes, die for me? Peter, you're not even going to live for me. You're literally about to deny me in a few days. Like, you're going to deny me tomorrow, three times, before the rooster even crows. Day's not even going to end, and you're going to deny me three times. Yeah, you want to die for me? Why is it we think we're so high that we, I want to go to Africa and die for God. And God's like, you won't even go to your neighbor. Like, I want to go die. He's like, you won't even go to Starbucks and read the Bible. What are you talking about? I want to go to the mission field. He's like, you don't share with anyone at your job. You're working a minimum wage job. You don't share the, your faith with anybody. And you're saving up to go to YWAM to go to the mission field. And God's like, you want to go to India to share your faith? And you're at Starbucks and you, you, you can't even share your faith now? Like, how are you going to save for a YWAM mission trip 
Well, meanwhile, you don't share your faith with anybody. This is us. This is me. We're all bold in our words. All bold. I know it's getting hot in here. The kitchen's getting hot. We're all bold. And he goes, oh, you're going to lay your life down for me? Most assuredly, you're going to deny me three times. Look at what Romans chapter 12, verse 3 says. For by grace it was given to me, and I say to every one, every, um, one among you, not to think of yourself more highly than you ought to think, but to think with sober judgment, each according to the measure that God has assigned. Here's what Paul is saying. You are drunk on your own on your own identity of who you think you are, your own reputation. You think highly of yourself. It's like, right? Isaiah Saldivar, think about this. I'm this great prayer warrior. All the things I could think of myself, but then I look at my life, I'm like, oh man, I don't even pray, I don't read, I don't, I don't live holy. Imagine that. I'm this hypocrite where I'm like, I think I'm one thing, but then I'm really something completely different. So it's better to not think highly of yourself. That's why I get on here and go, oh, maybe I do need deliverance. Maybe I do need, I do need to pray more. I, that's why I'm the first one to respond to my own altar calls. And you know, all the religious people make fun of me. Isaiah Saldivar says he has a demon and needs to get delivered. Isaiah Saldivar says he needs to pray more and they laugh. I don't want to think highly of myself. I don't want to think of myself as a super, trust me, friend, in my eyes, you probably think 10 times more highly of myself than I think of me. In my eyes, I'm unworthy, okay? I'm unqualified to do what God's called me to do. So I don't want to think highly. I want to have sober judgment. Don't be drunk thinking, oh, I'm this high exalted guy. I'm this super smart. Be like these Pharisees out here, all head knowledge, super lofty, know it all. I don't know it all. I'm like, Lord, teach me, teach me. I went through Bible college. I have a degree in theology. I did all of that. I've read the Bible over and over and over again. Friend, my whole life is this. I'm not br bragging on myself. And I still, at the end of the day, go, I don't know anything. This is my whole life is God. My whole life, I've, I've given my entire life to this. Every single waking, I've given my entire life to this. And yet here I am going, Lord, I don't know anything. Lord, I don't know anything. I, I don't, I don't, every time I read the Bible, it's like I see something new. And I just want to, I want, Lord, I want to stay humble. I want to stay on my knees. And oftentimes I get on my knees before the broadcast going, Lord, help me. Help me, Lord, I'm unworthy. I don't know anything, God, help me. I'm a beggar. I'm poor in spirit. I get on these stages before thousands of people and they're shouting and crapping. I'm going, Lord, that's not for me. I don't even know. I don't know, Lord. I'm walking with you, Holy Spirit. Teach me. And I get backstage and I've cried before going, Lord, what? Help me, Lord. Help me, God. I'm unworthy. I feel the pressure. Friend, when I get up in front, in front of thousands of people and preach, I'm not up there like, oh, I know it all. I feel the pressure. I go, Lord, I'm jumping. Every time I get up on stage to preach, I have no notes. I feel like, I'm jumping in the deep end. I, I have no clue how to swim. I have no clue how to swim. And I get up before thousands of people and I jump in the deep end and I go, Lord, you better help me here. You better teach me to swim on demand. And I just let the Holy Ghost come and speak out of me and come function with the unction. Really though. And I've been that way for 12 years. I'm not going up there going, I know it all. Here's my, guys, when have I ever claimed to know it all? I claim to know nothing but Christ crucified. Paul said all my education, that was rubbish. That's what Paul said compared to knowing Christ. So man, I really, my prayer is, Lord, let me stay humble, Lord. Let me stay broken before you, God. I don't want to get haughty, guys. I don't want to get arrogant and go, oh, this is how it is. I'm willing to learn. I'm teachable. I'm, I'm texting spiritual fathers all the time. Am I wrong in this area? Show me, help me. I'm watching videos. I'm changing my stance on things. Okay, Lord, help me. I'm moldable. I'm, I'm malleable. I'm, I'm shapeable. I'm not, I'm not clay that's dry, you know, I'm getting revelation as I speak here. You know that clay that gets hardened can't be molded? Clay that gets hard and gets crusty and dusty and religious? When you get off the potter's wheel and you get out of the place of prayer and out of the place of fasting and holiness and you sit on the shelf, that's, this is a word. I'm going to have to write, I was, somebody's taking notes because I need to preach this because it's just coming to me now. And you're off the potter's wheel and you get put on a shelf. You're not doing anything. You're just on a shelf. You get hard. You can't get molded. You're not malleable. You're not moldable. That's a lot of religious teachers today. They're not out there doing the work. They're not putting in effort. They're not out there praying for people. They're not doing anything spiritual. That's all head knowledge. They're on a shelf somewhere and they're hard. They're not in prayer. You know, the guys that know the Bible the most on YouTube, air quotes here, the most online, pray the least on stream. Like I look at some of these guys, I'm like, I've never seen you pray on your channel. You have a thousand videos, but you've never prayed. You've never prayed for your people. You don't pray on stream. What are you even, what are you doing? I mean, really though, it's like, see, cause prayer is the potter's will. When you get off the potter's will, 
you get hard, you get bitter, you get angry, and that's what these a lot of these guys are. But I'm like, Lord, keep me on that potter's wheel. There, when you're when you're making pottery, you're putting water on the clay, you're molding the clay, you're spinning the clay, you're in prayer, you're in the Word. Keep me on the potter's wheel. I don't want to get hard and stiff like some of these people out here because it's it's a bad road to go down. Okay, verse chapter 14. Let's get into this. Again, we're four, 50 minutes in. I told you I was going to try to take my time. Stay on the potter's wheel. Stay in prayer. Stay in holiness. Stay in fasting. Stay in the Word of God. If you're just in the Word of God and you don't pray and you don't fast and you don't commune with the Holy Spirit or spend any time with Him, you're going to get hard. You're going to get hardened. But if you stay in the work, you're doing the work, you're out there helping people on the streets, you're out there praying for people, ministering to people, keep that edge sharp. Keep Stay on the potter's wheel. I'm not going to listen to no one that ain't, that ain't doing anything. I'm not listening to no teacher that's not practicing what they preach. You know what that's called? It's called being a hypocrite. So don't be telling me how to do deliverance or how to pray for the sick or how not to when you don't do any of it. Like, yeah, I'm not going to take advice from a hypocrite. Ver chapter 14. Now, remember, there's no chapters when they wrote this. So just pretend this is one long thing tonight. Let not your heart be troubled. You believe in God, I believe, and believe also in me. In my Father's house are many mansions. If it were not so, I would have told you. I go to prepare a place for you. And if I go and prepare a place for you, I will come again and receive you to myself. That there, that where I am, there you may also be. And where I go now, that, and the way you know. Okay. Jesus is saying this. For, four, for three years, he's told the disciples to follow me. Follow me, follow me. Now he's saying, you can't follow me. Okay. Are you seeing here why he's saying, don't let your heart be troubled? Are you seeing the panic and the disciples, they've left everything. And for three years, you've been telling me to follow you. And now here you are saying, oh, by the way, you can't follow me where I'm going. I'm going somewhere you can't go. And Peter goes, what do you mean you're going somewhere we can't go? He says, I'm going away and you can't come. Friend, how do I say this? This is the worst news ever. This is the worst news ever. The worst news ever for guys that left everything to follow Jesus. Three years later, he goes, oh, by the way, I'm going somewhere you can't go. What? You've been telling me to follow you for years, but understand Jesus says, but I'm going somewhere to build something. And one day you're going to be with me from this is a promise to you and our kids. I go to prayer, pr prepare a place for you. Jesus is preparing something for you right now. The bottom line is this. He's preparing a place. And look at verse five. Thomas said to him, Lord, we do not know where you're going and how can we know the way? So we have no clue what you're talking about. Where are you going? Where are you going? And how do we know how to get there? You're telling us, I'm going to leave. I'm going to do prepare a place and you're going to come with me and I'm going to be gone. and You're not going to see me. They're like, what? This is the disciples thinking, Lord, we don't know where you're going. How can we know the way? And then look at verse six. Jesus says this. Oh, I love this. I love the Bible. Type one of you love the Bible. This is exciting stuff tonight. What's better than this? Jesus said to him, Whew, I feel the Holy Ghost on this. I want to start speaking in tongues right now. I am the way, the truth, and the life. No one comes to the Father except through me. Look at this. Thomas said to him, Lord, we don't know where you're going. How can we know the way? How do we get? How do we get to where you're going? Jesus says, I am the way, the truth, and the life. And no one comes to the Father except through me. Friend, whoo, come on, Holy Ghost tonight. Move up in this chat tonight, Lord. Except through me, nobody. Who comes? No one. How do we get there? Jesus. He's the way. He's the directions. He's the truth. And he's the life. Jesus says this. Jesus not, is not a way. That's what the world says. Jesus is, is one of the ways to get there. Or there's other ways. No, 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 no. He's not oh, a way. He's the way. He's the way. There's no other way to the Father's house except through Jesus. Jesus knows directions to the Father's house. Jesus is the way to God. This is what he's saying. I'm the way to God. Believing in me is the way to God. I'm also the source of all truth, and I'm also the one that gives eternal life opposed to eternal death. So I'm the way to get there. I'm all truth, and I'm the life. I give eternal life. All wrapped up in one statement. All wrapped up. No one comes to the Father except through me. Look at verse 7 here. If you had known me, you would have... So he's telling them, you don't know me. That's what he's telling the disciples. He goes, we're three years in and you don't know me. And is there anyone in the chat tonight that thinks they know God and doesn't? Is there anyone in the chat tonight that is like, I know Jesus. And tonight you're going like, oh, maybe I don't know him. So he says, if you'd known me, you would have known my father also. And from now on, you know him and have seen him. So from here on out, if you've seen me, you've seen the father. Philip said to him, Lord, show us the father and it is sufficient for us. 
<sighs> Philip. Philip, what are you doing, bro? He says, Lord, <laughs> just show us the Father. Make it plain. Make it plain. And then Jesus says this in verse 9. I can imagine Jesus frustrated. Have I been with you so long, and yet you've not known me, Philip? He who has seen me has seen the Father. So how can you say, I feel the frustration, Jesus. So how can you say, show us the Father? What are you talking about, Philip? I've been telling you since John 10, don't believe the miracles, believe the signs and wonders, know that I'm in the Father, know that the Father's in me. He's saying you should know the Father because you know me. Some of you are like, I can't wait to get to heaven and know the Heavenly Father. And Jesus goes, me and the Father are one. Jesus is God with flesh and bones. They already have a relationship with the Father through Jesus. That's what he's saying. Philip had the right desire, but Jesus' disappointment is this. This is his disappointment. Are you ready? I'm trying to make this simple. He's, he's, he's his disappointment is, I've been with you for three years and I've been showing you the Father through my works and through my words. And yet you're still asking to see the Father. What? Look at, look at, ver, look, hold on. Look at verse 11. Oh, look at verse 10. Do you not believe that I am in the Father and the Father's in me? The words that I speak to you, I do not speak on my own authority, but the Father who dwells in me does the works. Look at this. Believe me that I am in the Father and the Father's in me. Or else, believe me for the sake of the works for themselves. He goes, look it. If you're not going to believe me, as I said in John 10, believe the works. Believe the signs and wonders. I'm disappointed because you're asking me to see the Father, and I've been showing you the Father for three years. It's like, imagine me preaching. At the end of my sermon, you come up and say, I really wish you would have, pre you would have preached today. I'm like, dude, I just preached for an hour. What do you even mean? This is what they're saying. I wish you'd show us the Father plainly. He's like, I literally have made the Father known. When you see me, you've seen the Father. So it's very simple here. Look at 10. Do you not believe that I am in the Father and the Father is in me? Oh, we read that, verse 11. Okay, let's go to verse 12 here. Look at verse 12. Most assuredly, I say to you, he who believes in me, the works, oh, we're gonna, we're gonna have to camp out here for a minute. Do you guys have time? Type one if you guys have some time here tonight, Monday night, okay? Wing stop, open late, don't worry, you won't miss it. Applebee's, all that's open late. Just stay with me here, stay with me here. Verse 12. Most assuredly, I say to you, he who believes in me, now I'm going to go slow because I know a lot of religious people are going to start manifesting here. The works that I do, he will do also. Okay. Let's just, let's just let that simmer. Okay. For all those that are like, we're never going to do the things Jesus did. All those that are in that cessationist camp that say, how dare you think you're little Jesus, you're going to do the works of Jesus. Okay. Now, let me just remind you of a few things. Number one. These words are read. I mean, they're the words of Jesus. Number two, my ultimate authority is not in some religious YouTuber or some pastor at the church down the road that teaches against the, the scripture. My ultimate authority is the Bible. So I'm here, New King James Version. Okay, you can look in the King James as well if you're a King James only person. And I've highlighted it for you just in case you've, and I'm going to leave it highlighted just in case. Okay, the works I do, he will also, uh, I do, he will, he will do also. Look at this. Now, and greater works than these he will do because I go to my father. Other translations say the works I do, you also shall do. And whatever you ask in my name, verse 13, that I will do, that my father may be glorified in the son. If you ask anything in my name, I will do it. Now, this is a very strong statement. When he says ask anything, he's talking about according to my father so my father could be glorified. It's not like if you ask for anything, you're going to get anything. He's saying anything, and this is to bring glory to the Father. We know the Bible says if you pray for things that are vain, you ask amiss, things that are for selfish reasons, you're not going to get it. But here's what I want to say. Most translators would agree, and I would agree as well. When he says greater, he means greater in, you've heard this, extent and numbers. Okay, I agree. I agree. When he says greater, he means greater in extent and in numbers. That's fine. Okay, let's... For, I don't even want to argue about greater tonight. I don't even want to go, well, greater works we shall do. I'm not even going to argue that. And none of that. All I want to argue here and say it's so clear, and I've heard teacher, be it Bible teacher after Bible teacher say, how dare these people think they can do the works that Jesus did? Well, that's awkward because Jesus is the one that said it. What are you talking about? The same works. Now, what are some of the basic works Jesus did? Type them in the chat. What are some of the basic works that Jesus did? Because we're not talking greater. Forget about greater, right? In extent, in number, praise the Lord. That's all good. I don't, I don't really want to debate greater. Let's just talk about the same works. Type work, some of the works Jesus did right now in the chat in a basic sense. He, 
preached the gospel, good. He healed the sick, good. He cast out demons, good. He fed the poor, good, okay. What else did he do? Those are the mostly the main works that Jesus did. Now, how are you going to say? How are you going to say? Well, it, it didn't mean those. What do you mean it didn't mean those? The works I do, you also do. Why? Why? Because I'm going to the Father. That's why. I'm going to the Father. Okay? Now, some of you say, well, if you do the same works as Jesus, are you going to die on the cross? No, because it's not God's will for me to die on the cross. Now, some people may die on the cross. We're not dying for the sins of the world, but there are many people that have been martyred and have literally got crucified on a cross. So some people have literally died on a cross. Now, they didn't die for sin, but the argument like, well, are you going to also die on the cross like Jesus did? I hope not. I hope not. But it may come to that. I don't know. I hope not. This is just such a dumb argument. Like, oh, well, you're not going to die on the cross, are you? No. That's not what he was saying here. He was saying the same works I've done. So I don't know what false doctrine you can get wrapped in that lies about this, but this whole cessationist, oh, the works, we're not called to do the same works. I don't even know what you're talking about. How? How could you read that, interpret that? Now, I understand the greater, right? The greater is in greater in scope, and I get it, okay? Praise the Lord, I have a degree too. I understand what greater means in Greek and all that. Praise the Lord for that. But let's just be honest. We're not doing the same works he's done. We're preaching against the same works. We're literally preaching against miracles, against casting up demons, and against preaching the gospel. We teach against these things. Like, there's people out here that are... Now, I'm not, I don't do street preaching, but I'm not going to preach against it. I'm not going to preach against it. Go do it then. If God's called you to do it, go do it. Why are we preaching against street preachers? I don't understand this. Why are we preaching against miracles? Why are we preaching against deliverance? The problem, friend, you have is with the word of God. That's your problem. I'll never preach against street preachers. I'll never preach against miracles. I'll never preach against casting out devils. Because if I do, I'm literally preaching against the words in red. That's what I'm doing. So it's just, it's just, just a terrible argument. And it holds, it just totally keeps people in bondage. Verse 15, if you love me, keep my commandments and I'll pray to the father and he'll give you another helper that he may abide with you forever. The spirit of truth. I have an hour and a half video on the Holy spirit. I talk all about these words in Greek, what they mean. You should go watch it. It's about the Holy spirit. Just go search my channel. I don't have time to talk all of it tonight, but he says, if you love me, keep my commandments. I will pray to the father and he'll give you another helper. This is the Holy spirit that he may abide with you forever. Holy spirit hasn't left. He's been here forever. He's abiding with us. That's the spirit of truth. The Holy spirit. He's a person, not an it whom the world cannot receive because it neither sees him nor knows him. Again, the Holy Spirit. But you know him, for he dwells with you and will be in you. So he's dwelling with you now, but he's going to be dwelling in you soon. And then he says in verse 18, I will not leave you orphans. And again, I have a whole teaching on this for the sake of time. I can't go into all that I have planned for this. I will not leave you orphans. I will come to you. Why would he say I'll not leave you orphans? Because they feel like they're being left. Remember, thinking about, think about this. Three years, he says, follow me, follow me. Now he says, you can't follow me anymore and you can't go with me. So they feel like you're leaving us and he goes, no, I will not leave you orphans. I will come to you. How is he going to come to us? Through the person of the Holy Spirit. Jesus is going to come through the person of the Holy Spirit. Okay, verse 19. A little while longer and the world will see me no more, but you will see me because I live, you will, all, you will live also. At that day, you will know that I am in my father and you in me and I in you. So I, so Jesus goes, I'm in the father, you're in me, and I'm also in you. And that's a spiritual reality. He who has my, who, he who has my commandments and keeps them, it is he who loves me and he who loves me will love my father and I will love him and myself, um, and and manifest myself to him. Okay. So he who keeps my commandments. So yes, we keep the commandments of God. Jesus says, don't do this. Don't do this. All the commandments. We keep the things Jesus said not to do. Remember his commandments, Jesus's commandments. We keep it, and then look what he says it all it is also he who loves me so don't say you love god and you don't you don't keep his commandments and you live however you want don't do that and he who loves me so if you keep his commandments this is proof that you love jesus so proving you love jesus by keeping his commandments what happens look at you'll be loved by my father so the father sees you keeping jesus's commandments and the father loves it and the father loves you for that so the father loves you and Jesus loves you. And then Jesus says, and I will manifest myself to him. What does the word manifest means? It means there's something that's hidden or in the dark or not shown brought to the light. Okay. So Jesus says, if you do all these, I will show myself to you. I will reveal myself to you. And then look at verse 21, 22. 
Judas, not Iscariot, there's two Judases, remember, okay? Not Judas Iscariot, the other Judas, said to him, Lord, how is it that you will manifest yourself to us and not to the world? Jesus said to him, if anyone loves me, he'll keep my word and my father will love him and he will come to him and make our home with him. He who does not love me does not keep my word and the word which you hear is not mine, but the father who sent me. He's saying this, the world's not going to see me because they don't obey my commandments. They have no love. They don't, they have no, the father doesn't love them. Now, when Jesus says, I won't leave you like orphans, why? Because I'm going to send the Holy Spirit and the Holy Spirit is going to take over. And I'm going to say this nice and clear. The Holy Spirit's going to come and take over the discipleship role. The Holy Spirit will come and disciple you. You're not left as orphans because the Holy Spirit's going to take my place. And in fact, Jesus later will say, it's better that I leave so that I can send the Holy Spirit. So Jesus says, it's better for your sake. I go with the Father so that I can send the Holy Spirit and he can be in you. Because Jesus says, says it this way, I'm with you, but the Holy Spirit's going to be in you. Now, how could... Now, these are grown men, and they're probably thinking what you would probably be thinking. How could I be, how could Jesus be in me? How could a grown man who's like right there in front of me, remember, Jesus is talking to them right here, right here. He's talking to them in person, and he goes, I'm going to be in you. They're like, just think about it. Oh, I don't know about all that. What do you mean you're going to be in me? And he's like, yeah, I'm going to live inside you. And they're like, uh, you're 30, 33 year old grown man. You know, we're in our 30s. I don't think you're going to fit. Like, what do you mean? Nicodemus was like, what do you mean born again? How could I go back in my mom's womb and come back out? So think about it. They're asking these questions like, we don't understand. How is Jesus going to live in you? Somebody type it in the chat. I've said this before. Through the person of the Holy Spirit. Okay. Theologically, just think about this. Theologically. This is good. This is orthodox teaching, by the way. Theologically. Jesus is at the, the Father. God the Father. I'm, I'm Trinity, by the way. I'm Trinitarian. God the Father is on the throne. Jesus is seated at the right hand of the Father, forever making intercession for us. So Jesus is at the right hand of the Father, praying for us. So he's in heaven right now, Jesus. We are seated with Christ in heavenly places. But remember, so how is Jesus in us? Jesus is in us in the sense that the Holy Spirit lives in us. So by Jesus living in us, so the Father lives in us. Jesus lives in us. Why? Because we are the temple of the Holy Spirit. And when the Holy Spirit, good job, chat, you're typing it out. Jesus, our high priest in heaven, is living in us through the person of the Holy Spirit. So the Father's in me. Jesus said, I'll be in you, and the Father will be in you, and I'm in the Father, and the Father's in me. So Jesus in us through the person of the Holy Spirit. But theologically, the person of Jesus is in heaven, the Father's in heaven, and the Holy Spirit is God on the earth working in his people and through his people. And that's a whole other teaching that I have on the channel, okay? Look what he says here. I cannot wait for the next teaching. Oh, the true vine. This is going to get so good. But that's for another day because we're an hour and a half in. Verse 25. These things I've spoken to you while being present with you. So he says, I'm telling you th these things because I'm, well, I'm with you right here in person. But the helper, the Holy Spirit, whom the Father will send in my name, he will teach you all things and bring to your remembrance all the things I said to you. So the Holy Spirit will do two things. What will you do, chap? Teach and bring things into your remembrance. When I'm up there preaching, the Holy Spirit's bringing stuff into my remembrance that I forgot, that I studied. I will read, you know, a two-hour thing, document, and I'm like, okay, Holy Spirit, whatever you want me to speak, bring it to my remembrance. So the Holy Spirit teaches me, he teaches, and he brings things to our remembrance. Those are two things. Verse 27, peace I leave with you. My, so I'm leaving, and I'm going to leave you peace. My peace I give to you, not as the world gives do I give to you. Let not your heart be troubled, neither let it be afraid. So I'm giving you a peace the world can't offer. It's a peace, in the, a peace in the midst of trials, a peace in the midst of suffering, a peace in the midst of persecution, a peace in the midst of confusion. This is the way I would describe peace in the most basic, basic, basic sense. This is the way I would describe it. Everything's going to be okay. No matter what's going on in my life, bills, this, stress, family, sickness, pain, wherever you're at, some of you are watching from a hospital bed, some of you are watching from you know, under a bridge. Some of you, I mean, all over the place, people are watching. I meet homeless people. I met a homeless guy one time. He goes, oh, I watch your videos. I'm like, how? He goes, oh, I have a government phone. I literally, I'm, he told me this. I'm homeless and I watch all of your streams on his phone. So some of you are living a homeless life right now and you're like in the midst of my trials. Maybe you're on hard times. Maybe you're battling an addiction. In the midst of that, everything's going to be okay because I have the peace of God. No matter what, I have the peace of God. That's the bottom line reality. I have the peace of God. So remember, that's peace. The world can't give it. 
Only God can give it. And look what he says this, okay? I'm going away and coming back to you. If you love me, you would rejoice. Okay, so he says, peace I give to you. You have heard me say to you, I am going away and coming back to you. If you loved me, you would rejoice because I said this. I'm going to the Father, for my Father is greater than I. So he's going like, look, you should be excited. He repeats what he said earlier. I'm going away, which is dying. That's what he was saying. And I'm coming back, which is resurrecting, okay? If you're not catching it here, I'm going away, I'm dying, and I'm coming back, I'm resurrecting. Why would we be excited? Why should we rejoice? Are you guys ready? Jesus says, because I'm going home. I'm going home. This place is not my home. Jesus said, you should rejoice about this. You should be excited for me. Why are you not excited for me? And the disciples are like, what? You're leaving us. He goes, no, I'm going home. God goes home. When Jesus died, resurrected, and went to heaven, he went home. He went home to his father. He'd been gone from the father for three years. He left eternity to enter humanity, wrapped himself in flesh. And now he's been, he's been gone for 33 years. I said three, I meant to say 33. Three years of ministry, they've been with him. 33 years. How beautiful is that? This is beautiful tonight. I'm gonna shed a tear, this is beautiful. He gets to go home. I love this. He says, I'm going to my father. How beautiful is that Jesus gets to go home? After 33 years, he's been away from home. He goes, you should rejoice. You would rejoice because I said, I'm going to my father. For my father is greater than I. He's greater than I. Be excited about this. He says, and now I've told you before it comes that when it does, you may believe. So I'm telling you this ahead of time. So when it happens, you'll believe. I love tonight. I love this. Listen, okay, I know. It's not as, you know, it's not as whatever as some of the other teachings exciting for some of you, but I, I just love good Bible, good Bible, good Bible teaching going through the Bible. Verse 30, and we're almost done. And then we're going to pray. I will no longer talk much with you for the ruler of this world is coming. That's the devil. That's the devil's coming. And he has nothing in me. That's Jesus saying we have nothing in common. How awesome will it be for you to say the devil's coming, but he has nothing in me. I want to live my life I want to live my life saying the devil is alive and well and real, but he has nothing in me. Me and him have nothing in common. So that's what he's saying. Me and him have nothing in common, but that the world may know that I love the father as the father is giving this commandment. So do I arise. Let us go from here. And then we're going to go into, Ooh, this is going to be good. The true vine. Oh, that's going to be so good. Let's pray. Father, we thank you so much for your word, Lord. Lord, we thank you for what you're doing. We thank you, Lord, for what you did during the start of Holy Week. We glorify your name, Lord. We honor your name, God. We give you tonight the praise and all the honor. And Lord, if there is anyone listening right now, I pray, Lord, draw them back to you. I pray, Lord, if there's anybody listening, draw them back to you by your spirit, God. Tonight, I pray, Holy Spirit, bring them to repentance. Some of you need to get saved tonight. You need to call it to God. Say, Lord, I repent. I repent. I turn to you, Jesus. Lord, tonight, draw that one person. I feel it tonight. Draw that one person back to repentance, God. Spark that flame. Spark that flame. Those that have lost their fire, I pray, Holy Spirit, you would light them on fire tonight. Pour out your spirit, Lord. I pray tonight, Holy Spirit, pour out. I pray those that have never received the baptism of Holy Spirit or just have never spoken tongues, God, pour out your spirit tonight, God. Lord, I pray, Holy Spirit, fill them. Lord, I pray, Holy Spirit, fill them right now. Every single one of them. Fill them with your Holy Spirit, God. Fill them with your Holy Spirit, God. I pray right now, Holy Spirit, anoint them. Rivers of living water would flow out of them tonight, God. Heal those that are sick in body. Heal those that are sick in body, God. Deliver those that are in bondage to demonic spirits. Every foul spirit must go in Jesus' name. Every foul spirit must go in Jesus' name. Lord, I pray you would heal us. I pray you would deliver us. I pray you'd restore us in Jesus' mighty name. Draw us back to you, God. Fill us with your Holy Spirit and power. Jesus said, ask for the Holy Spirit. I will send another helper. How do I get the helper? Ask for the Holy Spirit tonight. Ask for the Holy Spirit. Lord, right now, I pray that every person watching, there's 2,000 of you on this broadcast right now on Facebook and YouTube, ask for the Holy Spirit right now. Father, we ask you for the Holy Spirit. We pray, Lord, that we would you would pour out your Spirit upon us. We hunger and thirst for righteousness, as your word says. You said those that hunger and thirst shall be filled. God, fill us tonight in Jesus' name. Fill us, Father. 
Fill us, Father, with your Holy Spirit. Give us that advocate, that paraclete, that helper, that attorney, that comforter that you talked about. I pray right now, Lord, fill us with your Holy Spirit. Anoint us. Anoint every single person right now. Father, anoint us with your Holy Spirit. Lord, if there's any sin in our life, we pray right now that you would stick your finger on it, God. Come on, chat right now. Everyone needs to be praying. Lord, if there's any area of our life that is not of you, if there's sin in our life, point it out to us, Father. Point it out to us in Jesus' name. Lord, I pray that you would point out sin right now. I pray that any compromise in our life, that you would just remove it in Jesus' name. Fill us with the Holy Spirit and fire. Anointing of the Holy Ghost right now, Lord. Help us to surrender fully to you. David said, if there's anything in my life that is, is sin against you or offends you, point out what offends you. Lord, whatever is in our life that offends you, I pray you would point it out to us right now. Anoint us, God. Fire of the Holy Ghost. Passion of the Holy Ghost. Deliver us from the fear of man. In Jesus' name, touch your people tonight, God. Have your way, Lord. Continue working. Continue working, Lord, in ways we can't even imagine. Continue moving, Father, in ways that we can't even imagine, God. Continue moving in people's lives tonight, God. Continue the revival that you've started in hearts. You've started the, the, in minds. You've, you've started this work, Lord. I pray that you would continue it to completion. Have your way, Holy Spirit. Have your way, Holy Spirit. Do what only you can do. Mark us, God, to be watchmen of this generation. Help us, Lord. We've been given the ministry of reconciliation. Help us to be reconciled back to you. In Jesus' name, thank you, Lord. Deliver us, Father. In Jesus' name, bless your people. Save our children, God. Save this great nation, Lord. Save this nation. Save, Lord, save this country, God. Whatever country you live in, just pray. Help us, Lord, in Jesus' name. Thank you, Lord. I pray for Lisa. Lisa, you keep saying no one sees me. The Lord sees you, Lisa. Man might not see you, but the Lord sees you. And the Lord hears your prayers, Lisa. Lord, touch Lisa tonight. She feels overlooked and unnoticed. This is her. This is your sign, Lisa. You're like, Lord, if, if that's you, have Isaiah call me out. This is your sign. I'm calling you out, Lisa. God wants to touch you right now. You've not been overlooked. You've not been forgotten about. You just prayed, Lord. Have Isaiah say my name, somebody. God's touching you right now, Lisa. God's touching you right now, Rallis. Touch her, Lord, right now in Jesus' name. Thank you, Lord. Maybe we'll have prayer night on Friday, which is Good Friday. We'll have prayer night. We need to keep these prayer nights going. They've been beautiful. They've been beautiful. Let's keep prayer. Keep prayer going, guys. Keep prayer in your home. We're going to do more live stream prayer nights. Pray with your family. Pray with your kids. Be excited about prayer. God is moving. God is moving and touching people. God is touching people and moving upon lives. I will be in New Jersey in July. I'll be, well, is it July? Let me give the date right now. I will be in New Jersey uh, July 14th through the 16th at V1 Church Breakers Conference. How do you guys like the verse by verse? Let me know in the comments. What do you think about tonight? Man, I just love it. I love the Bible. I love the Bible. It's so good. Every time I read it, I'm like, why don't people read this? Why don't people read this? It's so good. Come on, chat. I hope I make it exciting for Just some of you. Just a quick friendly reminder Hold on. to sow I didn't into mean the to broadcast. Do that. Hold on. As we say every week, don't uh, dine and dash. That? If you enjoy this content, pray about <laughs> I didn't mean to do that. That's awkward. That's awkward. Hold on. I meant to do this. There we go. <laughs> guys, the Bible is amazing. I feel like I'm drunk on the Holy Ghost. I don't know. The Bible is amazing, guys. Yeah, prayer nights are amazing. I love the Bible. <laughs> I didn't mean to do that. Random. Hey, everybody. If you guys want to partner with us, we do need your guys' partnership. If you can't afford it, don't feel bad. If you can't afford it, don't give. Guys, we have some exciting guests on the podcast soon. We have Jenny Weaver tomorrow night. We have a special guest the week after, which I'll announce soon. And then we have another special guest. I can't wait. That's going to be flying in in person. And then we're working on some other people. But we got a lot... Lot cooking, y'all. Lot cooking. So partner with that. Partner with us. Help us keep bringing people into the studio, doing these broadcasts. Partner monthly. Partner one time. Do whatever you can do. If you can't do anything, just enjoy. Enjoy freely if you can. If you want to give the links to give her on screen, you can scan the code. Give monthly. Give one time. That's all I'm gonna say. I'm not a beggar. I'm a believer. Again, those are like, oh, he's asking for money. Then don't give. That's it. It's simple. Paul said a workman is worthy of his hire. He's like, if an oxen works a field, how are you going to tell the oxen he can't eat from the field? Paul said, if I sow into you spiritually, I should reap physically. So it's biblical. If you don't like it, take it up with the Bible. 
But man, I love the word of God. I'm fired up. I feel the fire in my bones tonight. I'm telling y'all. Let's get some a little bit of music going here. Praise the Lord. All right, let's read the chat as you guys give. You want to give the links to give? Do it now. It's in the comments on the screen right there down below. Um, do it, do it, do it, do it, do it. Yes, I still have all of my little overlays for some of you. But it's not winter time. The snow is only for when it's really cold out. Okay? And again, thank you for everyone that partners. Even if I don't read your name out, God knows who you are. I will read those that give on PayPal in the link, and then I'll read the website later and the Venmo later. I haven't been reading the Venmo. I see the Venmo. I read the Venmo, but I haven't been reading it on stream because Venmo always has issues. Every time I try to read it, it goes back to the very top of the screen, and it's super frustrating. So who are some guests you guys want to see on? Who are some guests you guys want to see on? Okay, let's open it up here. I do have some guests lined up. New people, old people, good people, you know, all good people. I mean, I was going to say good people, bad people. We don't got no bad people coming on. I do, I actually do want to have Jordan Peterson on, okay? I'm actually going to reach out to him because I want to, I want to talk to him, but we'll see. We'll see what happens. I'll, I'll try to get him on if I can. Jim, thank you, brother. I know he's a very busy man, so we'll see. Jim, thank you, brother. Appreciate you, man. Always, uh, Jim, Jimmy. It's not Jim, it's Jimmy. Oh, the snow's on. You like the snow? It's Jimmy. It's Jimmy. I can't believe for, uh, three years I thought it was Jim Mai. Oh, I have something else to tell you guys. I have something else to tell you guys. So, should I tell you guys tonight? Hmm. I want to share with you guys. It is kind of weird, though. It is kind of personal. I mean, it's not really personal, but it's kind of weird. No snow, please. I got you. Okay, no snow. I'm scared. I'm scared. The snow's too much. It is kind of it is kind of weird, but it's like it's like an epiphany that I had. Okay, sorry. I said, tell me who you guys went on, and then you, uh, you guys all started commenting. I mean, then I started saying, let me tell you guys something. Thank you, Jimmy. Guys, if you want to donate, you can. There you go. David Lynn, I've had David Lynn on before. Steven Bankar, listen, Steven said, if you're watching this, Steven, text me, bro. No, Steven said, we do we do talk. He said that if, oh, it's Jim. Why did, why did TJ say it's Jimmy? Jim, you said it was Jimmy. I'm, I'm so confused, bro. I need help. Text me, bro. You have my number, Jim. Text me, bro. Is it Jimmy or is it Jim? Because TJ said it was Jimmy and you said, yeah, it's Jimmy. What is happening? I'm scared. Uh, Steven Bankars is not doing content right now. He said when he returns to doing content, he'll come on the show. Okay. Sorry. Okay. But Jim, I need you. Please, can you just donate a dollar and tell me your name, please? Because I, when TJ was here, TJ said it's Jimmy. And then you said, yeah, it is Jimmy. Is it Jimmy? Is it Jim? What do I call you, brother? Um, Young Don. Yeah, I'll have Young Don on. We've talked a little bit in comments and stuff like that. But I don't even know how to reach out to him. I've, uh, I don't know how to reach out to him. I'll try. You guys tell him to hit me up. Cherish will be on. Yes, she will be. Jim, Jimmy. Is it Jim or is it Jimmy, bro? Because it's Jim Mai, but then he said it was Jimmy. Now I'm confused. Brian Trejo, he's a, he's a friend of mine as well. It's Jim Mai. I know. I know it is. That's why I always say. But then TJ said, no, it's Jimmy. Jim Mai is Jimmy. And then I and then Jimmy said, yeah, it's Jimmy. I'm, I'm so confused. I have to know this, though. I can't sleep tonight unless I figure out is it Jimmy or Jim Mai. Thank you, Sharon Becerra. Thank you so much. All the Venmo, thank you guys so much. I'll read it right when I get off, but the Venmo's acting up. I'll try tomorrow to read the Venmo if I can get it updated. Okay, uh, sis said you're a good brother. Thank you, sis. I'm pretty sure that's not my sister, but maybe it is. Thank you, sis. <laughs> All right, Jimmy. Don't know where he's love you, bro. Jim, what is it, bro? Hold on. Guys, please find Jim's. Uh, I go by both. Okay, you go by both. Okay. But my point is this, Jimmy, Jim, if it's Jim Mai, is that Jimmy? That's my point. What does Jim Mai mean? That's my, that's what I need to know. I need to know what does Jim Mai, is that, did you mean to put Jimmy, but you accidentally hit a space? That's what I need to know. Oh yeah, epiphany. Oh, you want to know. You want to know about the thing that I have to tell you guys. Okay. I'll tell you in a second. Okay. I'm reading all these names here. Okay. So I'll tell you guys now, since you guys keep asking. Next Friday, I will be in person with Ruslan. Yay! Those of you that keep asking me to have Ruslan on, next Friday I'll be in Southern California because I'm taking my family on vacation there, but I'll be with Ruslan on Friday night in studio for the podcast live at his studio. So I will be interviewing him live in his studio on my channel. And then me and him will do content together for his channel. But yes, next week, next Friday, I will be with Ruslan in studio in person in high five distance. So that's going to be fun. And we're going to do a bunch of content together. 
So we'll see what happens. All right, that's gonna be fun. So I, I'll tell you that. Okay, now do you guys want to know my kind of personal weird story? Uh, you guys are like family. I don't really have that many friends, so I kind of just tell you guys everything. So this is how the story goes. And you guys are gonna know about it because I'm gonna, you know, I'm gonna have to cancel some streams, but we'll, but we'll go as we go. Um, a couple weeks ago, or last week, I brought my daughter to the dentist, to a new dentist, and we went there. They were looking at her teeth, you know, her teeth are really crowded. So she has to get some teeth extracted and she's going to be getting like a first stage of braces and she's only six. So the dentist was like, oh, she has, the dentist was telling her, I'm going to try to tell this properly. The dentist was telling her, how do you, uh, or put your tongue at the roof of your mouth. And she couldn't put her tongue on the roof of her mouth. And the dentist was like, move your tongue here, move your tongue there. And the dentist said, oh, do you know? that she has like a severe tongue tie, like she has a tongue tie. And I'm like, tongue tie? Well, as the dentist is telling her to do all these things with her tongue, I realize I can't do any of those things. I'm like, I can't put my tongue at the roof of my mouth when my mouth is open. My tongue could barely stick out far. I know it sounds weird. That's why I said it's weird, but just hear me out, okay? And I'm like, I told the dentist, I'm like, uh, cause we're at the kid's dentist, right? She's, an ad she's been doing an adult dentistry for 20 years, but she's a kid's dentist. Now she's a kid's dentist. Amazing lady, I'll, by the way, she's awesome. I can't recommend her enough. So she said, um, she said, so I said, yeah, I think I have that. So I'm sitting there with journey and I'm like, I think I have that. She's like, no way. She's like, open your mouth. So I show her the bottom of my tongue and she's like, you have severe tongue tie. Now, mind you, I've never heard of tongue tie in my life. None of my kids, except I guess journey have it. No one's ever told me I had it. And mind you, I've been to the dentist my entire life. Okay. I've been to the orthodontist. I got braces at 15 and 16. I got after I had braces, I got Invisalign again for three years. So I'm on my, I have literally a top tray of Invisalign. Where's it at? I literally have Invisalign right here. So I'm doing Invisalign on the top. I just finished Invisalign on the bottom. My point of that is like, I'm in the dentist all the time. So I'm in the dentist all the time, all that kind of stuff. So no one's ever told me about tongue tie. So apparently I have it like severely. So I go look at the symptoms. She's like, look at the symptoms. And I look at the symptoms, lack of appetite. Come on chat. I was like my whole life. I've been wondering. Lack of appetite, picky eater, because apparently, like, if you have it severely, it ruins your taste buds. Not pronunciating your words good, which, by the way, you might know this, but I hardly ever pronunciate my words. I talk so fast, my words don't pronunciate. In fact, I barely move my tongue when I talk because my tongue's so restricted. My tongue's ba basically, basically, my tongue's been on timeout for 30 years. Okay, that's basically it. It's been restricted on timeout for 31 years. So I was like having this epiphany, like what? So we ended up talking for almost an hour and I'm like every symptom, lack of, okay, here's the other symptoms, neck problems, neck strain, back problems. And then, you know, I was watching one of my streams editing the other day and I noticed every time I talk, I lean my neck forward like this. Okay. That's not normal. So she said, the reason why is your body is so smart that because your tongue's not working, it's a muscle, it's not working properly. It makes you have to lean your head forward because your neck and your back muscles have to compensate for the fact your tongue's not working properly. So that could be contributing to my back pain, my neck pain, the stiffness of neck, all the stuff that you guys already know about that I'm praying healing of and all that stuff. And God has healed me in certain areas for sure. Trust me, I've 100% received the healing from God in certain areas. But I still like today, I haven't really had neck problems in a while and today my neck has been so bad. Like I almost didn't stream because my neck is in so much pain. So basically put it this way every symptom on that list of tongue tie is stuff that i deal with that i'm like praying lord what is this so she's like yeah i can't believe no one's ever told you so they are going to because i'm 31 she said i have to do therapy for like three to four months so she's like i won't even cut your thing she's gonna cut it do you guys want to see it is that weird to show you are you guys gonna be like grossed out if i show you the bottom of my tongue maybe that's too far i don't know i don't know what's weird or what's not but she's like, we're gonna laser your tongue. So she's gonna cut that thing that holds my tongue down. It restricts your tongue, basically. It's like a 5% chance you have it. it's hereditary, all that. So, um, no, I'm, I'm not leaving it alone. I'm not leaving it alone because number one, it, it restricts my speech. It makes me have neck pain, back pain. My appetite's terrible. I never wanna eat. I have terrible taste buds. Nothing tastes good to me. So in 10 years, it's just gonna be worse if I don't take care of it. Okay, everyone wants me to show it. I'm gonna show it right now. You guys are gonna laugh. You're gonna laugh. And I want to pronunciate my words. I'm tired of not pronunciating. Like I just don't pronunciate. So long story short, I'm going to do three months of oral therapy, which is like doing tongue exercises, which is so weird. So I won't be in the physical gym. I'll be in the tongue gym. So I'm, I'm getting an oral therapist and we do these things. And then after three or four months, she said, I will laser it. Cause she said, if I laser it right now, it's not a big deal. I'll laser it and then stitch it up. Cause mine's like pretty severe. If I laser it and stitch it up, 
then your tongue is just going to be all like, eh, it doesn't know what to do. So I have to do like the therapy. She's like, I won't even touch it for four months until you get therapy. So four months of therapy, then she's going to zap the bottom of my tongue and my tongue will be free. It'll be basically, she's going to deliver my tongue. Okay. My tongue's been restricted and bound and she's going to loose it for real though. So here, let me show you guys. Okay. So this is as far as I can stick out my tongue. Don't laugh, but it's getting fixed. This is as far as I can stick out my tongue. That's literally as far as I can stick up my tongue. And I, yes, I scrub my tongue, okay? It looks a little white, but I scrub it every single day. But that's as far. I didn't know. I just told people, oh, I have a small tongue. I'm like, what? She's like, you don't have a small tongue. Your tongue's restricted. So watch this. This is crazy. Look. Uh, can you see that? Uh, there's a, literally a string, and it's gross. You could Google it, but there's a string holding my tongue down. Uh, I can't even touch the roof of my mouth. So you're so you're supposed to open your mouth fully and be able to touch your tongue. I, I feel bad for those of you that are just jumping in the broadcast. I'm sorry. I'm just pouring out my whole life here with my with my people. But you're supposed to be able to open your mouth fully and touch the roof of your mouth. And look, I can't even get close. Look at this. I can't even get halfway to the roof of my mouth. So, yes. Someone said it's not that bad. It's <laughs> apparently it's severe. She said this is like severe, severe. So they're going to cut it back and then stitch it. And then hopefully I'm hoping that I don't come on stream and be like, oh, I just spit everywhere. I'm hoping I don't get on stream and I'm like, hey, guys, welcome to the broadcast. My tongue. I'm really hoping that I don't come on stream. Like, you know, those 40 like dogs when they're like 20, the chihuahua that's like 20 that should have died like five years ago, but just won't die. And the dog has like a ton of uh, I'm hoping that I don't come on stream and I'm like that. So she said that I got to get therapy <laughs> before. So my, t so my tongue's not just like, listen, if you study the tongue, cause I'm a nerd, I'm watching all these videos. The tongue is very interesting. The Bible says it's like a rudder. It's small, but it steers the whole strip, uh, the whole strip, the whole ship strip. What? <laughs> Help me Lord. <laughs> it steers the whole ship. <laughs> what is happening right now? The tongue steers the whole ship. It's like a rudder. The Bible says it could light a whole your whole life on fire. So the tongue is the only part of the body. I forgot. I used to do a thing. Oh, it's the only part of the muscle in the body that's not connected to the skeletal system. It has it like a mind of its own, they say. But if you study the tongue, which I mean, if you're a nerd like me, you will. But you start reading about the tongue, it's crazy. Yeah, it's crazy. Yeah, so hopefully it'll help with my appetite. It'll help my neck and back pain. Of course, I'm praying that the Lord would just zap it. But, you know, I'm also, if he doesn't, I'm going to go get it zapped from the, the dentist. But <laughs> help me, Lord. Hopefully, it'll help my appetite, help my neck pain, my back pain. She told me if I don't do this in 10 years, my pain, all that is just going to be worse. So I want to get it taken care of. And hopefully, I hopefully I don't have, I'm. this is what I'm praying. I'm hoping that I come out of the, it's not really like a surgery. They do do stitches, but it's not like a big deal. I don't want to be a drama queen. Be like, I'm going under the knife. Everybody help me. I'm going under. I hope I make it out. It's not that dramatic, okay? But hopefully I come out of it with an Australian accent. I'm just praying. I was like, can I get an Australian accent? Is that an option? But I'm praying that like once my tongue's free, then I'll, I'll be able to have an accent. Someone said, I just checked. I have restricted tongue too. L Esther, listen, I've went 31 years, dentists, orthos, doctors, no one's ever looked, looked and told me. So my question to her was, because I felt like I was getting the gospel presented to me. I was like, how does no one know about this? And she said, well, to get your, li you know, your license, your certification to become a dentist, you don't need to go. It's extra. She said, I spent $100,000 this last year learning about this, studying this, and now I'm able to help pr patients. So yeah, that's that. Someone said, bro, stop. I don't know what part of the broadcast you're in, so I don't know where you're telling me to stop. But yeah, I'm hoping I get an Australian accent or a British accent. I wouldn't mind anything really from Australia or the UK accent would be cool. I wouldn't mind coming out sounding like Peppa Pig, honestly. I wouldn't mind sounding like uh, Georgie Pig and just having a full-on accent. I think that'd be cool. I think, you know, a lot more people would watch the broadcast if I had a cool accent. So we'll see. But I'm just hoping my my tongue doesn't stick out, you know, just like flops out like an old chihuahua, 30-year-old chihuahua. If you know, you know. I have the strip too, but I can touch the roof of my mouth. Yeah, some people don't have it bad. Some people have it severe. My case, this is what she said, okay? And apparently everyone's a dentist tonight in the chat. I didn't know that, but apparently everyone is. She said I have like a severe case. So yeah, that's as far as I can stick my tongue out. I, that's crazy, y'all. So we need to get this thing cut. My tongue should not be restricted. 
Hopefully it helps me pronunciate words better. Hopefully I get an Australian or accent or the UK. If not, I'm gonna have to go, you know, live in the UK and have everyone call me daddy pig and then get an accent there. So we'll see. All right, let's read the chat. Your tongue is so short and your mouth is big. You'll be fined. My tongue is not short. My tongue is restricted. I thought it was short. I used to say, oh, my tongue's short. She's like, no, your tongue is not short. Your tongue's restricted. So hopefully it gets ungrounded and cut and all that. Loose my tongue in Jesus' name. Okay, I'm reading the chat. What's your Latino heritage? Were my dad's side is from Mexico. <laughs> yes. As you guys saw, I have four little girls, so I know all about Peppa Pig. Yeah. So, you know, the funny irony is it's called tongue tie. She's like, you have tongue tie? But I was like, ask my wife. I talk a lot. My tongue is definitely not tied. I literally told her, I said, I talk for a living. So I'm definitely not tongue tied. But yeah, she just said, oh, 31 years. You've learned to adapt with it. But she's like, you should get it. Also, like has, uh, what is it called? You have trouble sleeping, breathing. I have like this other breathing issue that I've never talked about that I won't go into tonight. But yeah, anyways, prayerfully, all of it's going to be solved by this continue to pray for me all that it's all good it's all good it's all god it's all good what's your middle name luke i'm 31 nia my husband and son have this yeah it's a five i think it's five percent five percent of people have it it's hereditary as well but yeah it's not uncommon it's like a common thing i'm like how have i gone 31 years and i'm a nerd i watch videos and all that i don't know how have i gone 31 years all these dentists no one's ever noticed it you might bite your tongue when you eat. Oh uh, yeah, that's true. That's kind of scary. But I got to get it done, guys. I got to get it done. I'm in severe pain all the time in my neck and back. And the doctors are like, oh, we don't know. So yeah, if this has anything to do with it, which I think it does partially, I talk a lot and I'm on, you know, all that. And then hopefully we'll see. What's the recovery like? I don't know. She just said the therapy is the most important, but I don't know what the recovery is like, Cherish. By the way, guys, Cherish Chanel on YouTube is my little sister. If you guys didn't know, Cherish chanel are you a mod cherish you should be let me make you a moderator so you could ban people if you need to i want to make her a moderator so you guys can see her name all right you're a moderator now cherish uh add as moderator okay cherish if you see someone saying something crazy you could click their name and, and you can mute them now there you go you've been given the power to mute and ban if you need to can you roll your r's uh i don't know how how do i try do they put you under when they zap your tongue? No. For kids, they do. So, like, my daughter has uh, lip ties. So, her lip has that. She has lip ties and a tongue tie. So, they're going to put her under and they're going to cut her lip ties, cut her tongue tie, and then pull some teeth because she's going to be needing, like, a first stage of braces and all that stuff. So, yes. Now, I'm thinking I might have a moderate tongue tie. I'm, I guarantee tons of you are realizing you have it. I wish someone would have told me. Like, you know, I feel like a tongue tie evangelist now telling everyone check your tongue because I'm like I wish someone would have told me because there's like Google the symptoms. There's like 20 symptoms Yeah, cherish you're fancy now. You got a little tool by your name Yeah, cherish Chanel is my little sister for those of you, you know, she's I know she's like a celebrity to a lot of you guys because she's the one that invited me to church Uh, You guys are scaring me talk fast and you'll be biting the tongue after it's been cut free ouch. I hope not I don't think so. I hope not. I don't, I don't think I'll bite my tongue because I don't bite down when I'm talking. So, yeah. You gotta let us know what tongue therapy is like. Okay, tongue therapy, I've already started some of it, is basically tongue exercises. So it's like doing like what's called the jawbreaker, which is this. You gotta do that like a bunch of times. You gotta do this thing where you put your tongue in circles. You gotta do this thing where you put your tongue. I won't do it because I, I already know you guys are setting me up to like make me look dumb so you can laugh. But it's like... You put your tongue... I'm not going to do it, y'all. Now I'm going to end up teaching you guys tongue exercises. This is getting weird. You put your tongue to the roof of your mouth. There's like five exercises. So, yeah. You do a bunch... But I haven't called the official therapist yet. They're, I'm just doing the basic ones to start out with my daughter because she has to get it done. What? Wait, what's going on? I'm getting my tongue cut. I'm getting that thing at the bottom of my tongue cut so my tongue could be free because apparently it's restricted. <laughs> no, I'm not doing all these tongue exercises. But, yes, there's like five or six exercises I do three times a day with my daughter. That I'm doing with her. You make me laugh so much. I'm glad. Tongue push-ups. <laughs> oh, man. Yeah. Yeah. Praise the Lord. Praise the Lord that he brought us to this new dentist. She's amazing. I have four kids. So going to the dentist with four kids, imagine that. Taking four of them. It's quite the, quite the, the, the spectacle, to say the least. And dental hygiene and all that is important. Go to the dentist, y'all. Dental health is important. Okay? Jordan Peterson, yes, he's a Christian. 
All right, where's the pigeon? He's right here. That's enough tongue talk. Yeah, it's like, man, my tongue's restricted, but I speak in tongues and I talk for a living, which is crazy. I've ripped that string on my tongue before. Yeah, you can rip it. And if you rip it, you don't need to get the surgery. So some kids rip it when they're little and yeah, all that. Yeah, I was at the dentist today. Are you still going to take deep breaths after you forget to breathe? Well, I take deep breaths when I preach live because I'm shouting so loud and I'm preaching. So those deep, <gasps> that's a breath. People are like, why do you do that after every word? I'm like, it's called breathing. It's how I preach. So, um, yes. Carl the dove. Carl the born again pigeon. Do you know Richard Lorenzo Jr.? I don't, but I will look him up. Where is he at? Where's Richard Lorenzo Jr. at? Is he on YouTube? Uh, Facebook? All that. Yeah, a lot of people are scared of the dentist, but you know what? You got to go. You got to go. It's important. My mom would always say, you only get one set of teeth. You need to take care of them. I don't think I can roll R's. Rolled R's are double R in Spanish. Like, uh, let me see if I could say that. How do you pronounce that? Ped, Pedro, Pedro. I don't know. I can't say that. I, maybe I can't roll my R's. I don't know. I don't know how to say that. I don't want to try it on stream. Let me try it. Hold on. No, I don't think I can do it. <laughs> I don't think I can do it. It sounds painful. Yeah, I don't know. They're going to they're gonna numb my mouth. They're going to numb it so I won't fill it. And they use a laser and they just bzzz, zap it off. Yeah, I got my wisdom teeth pulled a long time ago. Do a British accent. I can't practice on stream. I have to like practice off stream. Puerto, Puerto, Puerto Rico. I don't know how to say. It. You're saying it like Trump said it. Are you trying to say it the way Trump? You pre, you you uh, you spelled it the way Trump says it. Have you guys seen a video of Donald Trump saying Puerto Rico? Richard Lorenzo Jr. is on YouTube. Have him on. Okay, I'll check out his stuff. Okay, I'll check out his stuff. My wife's laughing. No, I don't speak Spanish. Peppa Pig goes to the dentist is a great show. Yeah, I our kids watch the Peppa goes to the dentist. They watch the Cocomelon going to the dentist. So we try to make it fun for them. You know, take them to get a toy after all that good stuff. Um, I think I could roll my R's when I speak in tongues, but I don't think I can do it outside of speaking in tongues. Say Maria, 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 Maria. Is that rolling? Maria, Maria. I don't know. I don't know if that's rolling. I'm a, I'm such a bad Mexican. I'm sorry. I'm sorry, y'all. My dad's full-blooded. He doesn't even speak Spanish. I know you're watching, Dad. Sorry, but it's true. We're very white Mexicans. Americanized. Oh, well, don't say that, brother. That's racist. We're Americanized. <laughs> Some of y'all are just... Just calm down. Just calm down. All right, everyone's saying Richard Lorenzo Jr. I'll look at his stuff, okay? What's up with that movie in theaters that's casting out demons? Yeah, it's our movie we're part of. Go get a ticket. Come out in JesusName.com. April 10th and April 11th. No, you're not rolling? Okay, I'm not rolling. Maria. Maria, Maria. No, I'm not rolling. Okay, I don't know. I don't know the roll then. <laughs> what isn't racist nowadays? Dude, anything I say, people are like, you're not allowed to say that now. I'm like, can you guys come out with like a book of what I'm not allowed to say that every year more words are added? Pretty soon we're not even gonna be able to talk. We're gonna be like robots out here. Yes, I'm half Italian, half Hispanic. I'm half Italian, half Hispanic, half Mexican. My wife said something funny, everyone's laughing. Awesome, you're going to the movie April 11th? April 10th and April 11th, the movie will be in theaters. I think you're rolling your R's, I don't know. Speaking tongues? Um, what do you mean, like to see if I can roll my R's? Well, speaking in tongues, I can't control what I'm saying, so I don't know. This helps roll R, this helps roll R. What? I'm from Mexico, this helps roll R, I don't know what that means. I don't know what my wife's saying, but she's saying something funny, apparently. Mex-Italian? Yeah, I'm Mex-Italian. Thank you, everyone, giving tonight. Let's get back to the word. We're done, bro. We just did the word for an hour and a half. We are done. This is the end of the broadcast where I read the chat. So, yes. Rewind, rewind. If you want to see the word of God, go back, go back. I'll literally preach for an hour and a half and then pray for 10, 15, 20 minutes and then hang out with the chat for 10 minutes. And while I'm hanging out with the chat, everyone's like, go back to the Bible. Why aren't you preaching? Um, cause right now I'm just reading the chat. That's why. So you could rewind it or I have, uh, like 1200 other videos of like a lot of preaching and teaching too. You could check out. I'm not even being sarcastic or rude either. I'm literally just saying, do you like Boba? Yeah, I do. I do. 
Yakima date. Yakima. How do you say Yakima? Is it Yakima? 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 June 17th. Uh, June 17th, Saturday night, I'll be in Yakima. Is that how you say it? Somebody help me. Yes, if you want to hear preaching, go rewind or go watch another video. Because this is like the ch this is like the where we come down and we talk to the chat and be human and then end it. What did you say about my hairline? You said I have the Star Trek hairline? I just said that about myself, by the way. No one said that. I just like to make fun of myself every once in a while. The chat's moving too fast, so whatever you said about my hairline, I, I missed it. Yeah, I'm going to try to get my videos translated to Spanish at some point. Uh, my hairline has always been like this my whole life, just completely straight across. Since I was a little boy. Yeah, June 17th. How do I say it? Is it Yakima? Do you pray what you guess to have on every time? Yes. Do you have Orbeanies? No. Uh, my wife? Wait, what? What are you talking about, Alyssa? She said you can't roll your R's because you can't touch the roof of your mouth. Well, I mean, I can if my mouth's not open all the way. I can touch the roof of my mouth, look. Just not when my mouth's open all the way. And I don't talk like that. Eh. I don't talk like that. I'm not talking with my mouth open all the way. Uh, yak like back. Uh, Yakima. So I'm saying it right. So it's Yakima. Yakima, Washington. I'm preaching in Stockton April 30th. April 30th. I will be at Life Song Four Services. Bring Ty Jackson on stream. I don't know who that is, but I'll look them up. How often do you get a haircut? Every single week. When are you coming to Phoenix? I don't have a date right now. You did it. You did a British accent. What? When did I do that? What are you doing after you end the stream? Probably getting food because I haven't ate. Uh, Peppa Pig and Coco Melon. I, I mean, I haven't seen anything wrong in them. There's like a Halloween episode of Coco Melon and Peppa Pig that we just don't ever play the kids. But I mean, for the most part, I don't see anything wrong with them. But use your own discretion. Well, I mean, you just put pronunciation in, and I don't even know what language that is. That is that Jackama? I don't, I don't understand that. The next chosen reaction video is when the chosen comes out again. We're done. We did the whole season three. Yeah, we're done. I'll post the New Jersey info soon. I'm hoping to pick up an Australian accent sometime this week. I wouldn't mind anything from the UK or Australia. The new Chosen's next year. Why are you so funny? I'm laughing. I'm choking on my food. I try to be. I literally, listen, if I wasn't such a serious preacher, because I don't really joke when I preach because I'm very serious about the word of God and preaching, but I would like to do some type of stand-up comedy. I know it sounds weird. I don't know. I, I don't know. I, I, I think it would be fun. Like Christian stand-up? I don't know. It would be weird. It would be weird because I'm, I'm a preacher. I don't think I should try to cross into that, but I think it would be fun just for like one time thing. You should let your hair grow up for like a month. No, thank you. I'll look like one of the guys on The Chosen. Oklahoma. What's your favorite cuisine? Um, I don't know. You'd be a hilarious stand-up comedian. I, I, want to, I want to do something. Maybe I'll just do a, a, a comedy stream. People get so mad if I, if I tell any funny jokes and like they're so clean. People get so mad. Some people are just like, I hate laughing. Ha, ha, ha. I'm like, what? Why do you hate laughing so much? Laughing's good for you. Tell your face to smile. You would not believe how many negative comments I got. Well, I got, you know, I got for every 1,000 positive, one negative. But still, I didn't think I'd get any negative of me and my wife just joking and laughing. They're like, how dare you? How dare you laugh with your wife? I'm like, what? Why? Some people hate laughing. I get it, right? If you're like, you know, your abs are sore, but still. Jeff During, I'll look him up. I don't I don't know a lot of these people. I need to look them up. You guys are putting names like I know them. I got to look them up. Oh, Jeff Durbin. Oh, I know of him. Because there's a podcast under his church, I believe, called Coltish. And I'm actually going to be going and doing an in-person episode with them on Deliverance at some point. Oh, if the offended people about the jokes? Yeah. Uh, offended people, they just don't like the jokes. Yeah, I'm gonna, I'm not gonna let it stop me. They say they say that about deliverance. Every time I preach on deliverance, the next day there's three or four videos about me on YouTube about how I'm so false because I preach on deliverance. I don't care. I'm just gonna keep doing it. 
Go somewhere else then. Go somewhere else if you don't like it. You can leave, Napoleon. The naysayers. We love your loud, speedy preaching, brother Isaiah. Thank you. Okay, we've been live two hours. It feels like old times. Two hours and seven minutes? Hmm, when's the last time that happened? Feels like old times here. Wow, amazing. Tomorrow, we're talking about women in ministry. It'll be controversial. If you can't handle the chat going crazy, don't be in the chat tomorrow. Because I'm telling you, it's going to be... It's going to probably be pretty crazy tomorrow. But we're going to talk about women in ministry and give you some verses and give you our stance on it. And so buckle up, mods, load up, load up, load up the band hammer, get ready. My wife hates when the chat is like mean or controversial, so she will not be in the chat tomorrow. But for all of you, get ready. It's going to be interesting. It'll be good. It'll be good. Anytime I talk about Christians having demons, oh, I'm spilling water everywhere. Or women in ministry, people go crazy. So it's all good. Oh, my wife said, no, I literally have things to do, but I also can't stand rude comments. Yeah, I know you won't, you won't want to see the chat tomorrow. All right. I love you guys. We'll see you guys tomorrow at six o'clock. Get ready for the most fire song you've ever heard. Before I play this song on the stream ending, I'm just going to tell you ahead of time. This is The song is called Come Out in Jesus' Name by Jeffrey Jocelyn. Are you all ready? Let's do it. Wait, where's the song? Oh, no. Where's the song? Hold on. Where'd the song go? Hold on. Hold on, chat. You gotta stay around for this fire song. Stream ending, stream starting. Where, where did it go? Let's see. Where, oh, here it is. You guys ready? Here we go. Thank you guys for being here tonight. It was amazing. We will see you guys in the next one. Oh, hey. Didn't see you. I was just chilling down there listening. If this, if you've enjoyed this video, go ahead and hit the like button. Super easy, super free. Helps a lot. All right, so right now, stop what you're doing. Hit like. Okay, I'm going back down here. Bye. Calling every Christian. There ain't no time to waste. Come out in Jesus' name by Jeffrey Jocelyn. The song is fire. never going to change. Thank you guys for being here. It was a great night. I love every one of you. Thanks for partnering and giving. In one accord, we're moving forward. Break every chain. This is now our theme song, so get over it. Demons start to tremble. Devils go insane. The fear the things get hotter as they try to run away. They try to hide, but they're out of time when they hear the saints proclaim. Every unclean spirit must come out in Jesus' name. Yep, gotta bring out Carl for the kids. The kids love him. You can read it in the Bible. It's written there in red. Never be Go download the song. If you believe what Jesus said. We're running out of time. Tell everyone. Thanks for being here, chat. Turn the darkness Have a good night. Light. So let the fire begin. Have a good night, guys. Devils go insane. The feel of flames get hotter as they try to run away. They can try to lie, but they're out of time when they hear the saints proclaim. Every unclean spirit must come out in Jesus' name. So good. The song's so good. How could you leave during the song? It's so good. Oh, you know Carl's got the rhythm. Come on. That's <laughs> so funny, dude. Jeffrey Jocelyn is the singer. Yes, it's the start of Holy Week.
is the start of Holy Week. There you go. We're on Monday. Jesus clears the temple today. All right, everyone. See you tomorrow. Love you guys. Appreciate you guys. Have a great night. Sleep good. Be praying for me. I'll be praying for you. Okay. See you tomorrow. Good night. Every young spirit must come out in Jesus' name.